Welcome to an introduction to advanced actor-critic methods. I am your instructor, Dr. Phil Tabor. I'm a physicist, former semiconductor engineer, turned data scientist. In this course, you're going to learn the fundamentals of advanced actor-critic methods. Now, if you've seen some of my prior work here on the Free Code Camp, then you may have seen some work related to deep Q learning as well as actor-critic methods. There will be a little bit of overlap between the other actor critic courses and this material simply because I can't assume everyone has seen my earlier content. No need to go back and rewatch that though, although you are free to do so if you wish. I will include enough information in this particular course for the uh, motivated beginner to get started in the field of deep reinforcement learning and actor critic methods in particular. Now, why are actor critic methods important? Uh, that's a great question. I'm glad you asked. Uh, the basic idea is that uh, things like Q learning are great for learning. Uh, problems with discrete action sets like playing video games where you can move left, right, or shoot your phaser blaster the invading aliens, but it falls down when attempting to handle things like continuous actions. So this is important in fields like robotics where you are applying continuous voltages to uh, motors and joints to actuate movement. And so we need new technology to handle robotic movement uh, above and beyond uh, deep Q learning. Now, far from being a theoretical exercise, in March of 2021 this year, a group at Berkeley did in fact use deep reinforcement learning to um, get bipedal movement in a robot named Cassie. And I'm going to detail that on my channel. By the time you see this, it may already be out. So go ahead, check me out at Machine Learning with Phil. I'll leave a link in the description. You can go subscribe if you're interested in more deep reinforcement learning content. But enough of the shameless plugging. So actor critic methods are necessary for dealing with continuous action spaces, and they work by approximating something called a policy. A policy is a mathematical function that takes a state of the environment as input and outputs some action. Now, in the case of a robot, that action could be a, just an actual voltage that we apply to our motors, or it could be a probability distribution that we sample to generate some action. So for exa example, a uh, Gaussian distribution, you know, a normal bell curve that you sample to get some value for your action. We're going to cover both cases in this course. Uh, we're going to cover a whole host of algorithms, uh, starting with the vanilla actor critic method, deep deterministic policy gradients, twin delayed deep deterministic policy gradients, proximal policy optimization, soft actor critic, as well as asynchronous advantage actor critic. Try saying that five times fast. As far as software requirements go, they are relatively light. So we will need NumPy. PyTorch and Matplotlib. I highly recommend using the versions that I will leave for you in the description because NumPy in particular likes to deprecate stuff and that tends to break my code. Uh, so if you use the versions that I've linked in the description, uh, it's almost guaranteed to work provided we didn't make some mistake along the way. As far as hardware, you're going to need a GPU. Unfortunately, in 2021, the GPU market is totally broken, so hopefully you already have one on hand. If not, don't despair. In particular, the A3C algorithm, Asynchronous Advantage Actor Critic, is designed to run a multi-core CPU, so at the very least, you'll be able to run that and get really good results. Other algorithms, you may be able to get something that converges, although the timeline, the amount of time you're going to have to train, is going to be a little bit longer, so you may want to leave things running overnight. With all of that said, I will check in periodically for questions. Obviously, I don't get notifications from the free CodeCamp channel, but I'll do my best to patrol the comments to see uh, should there be any confusions or need for clarification, I can swoop in to render assistance. Once again, if you like this type of content, check me out at my YouTube channel, Machine Learning with Phil, where I go over all things deep reinforcement learning and occasionally natural language processing as well. Let's go ahead and get started, and I look forward to seeing you on the inside. Welcome back everybody. In today's tutorial, you are going to get a mini crash course in actor critic methods in TensorFlow 2. We're gonna have around 15 minutes of lecture followed by about 20 minutes of coding and you're gonna learn everything you need to know to go from start to finish with actor critic methods. If you'd like to know more, you can always pick up one of my Udemy courses on sale right now, link in the description. Let's get started. Welcome to the crash course in actor critic methods. I'm going to give a relatively quick overview of the fundamentals of reinforcement learning in general and then of actor critic methods in particular. Finally, we'll work together to code up our own actor critic agent in TensorFlow 2. This is geared toward beginners, so feel free to ask some questions in the comment section. Reinforcement learning deals with agents acting on an environment, causing some change in that environment, and receiving a reward in the process. 
The goal of our agent is to maximize this total reward over time, even if it starts out knowing literally nothing about its environment. Fortunately, we have some really useful mathematics at our disposal, which makes figuring out how to beat the environment a difficult yet solvable problem. The mathematics we're going to use relies on a very simple property of the system, the Markov property. When a system depends only on its previous state and the last action of the agent, we say it is Markovian. As we said earlier, the agent is given some reward for its action, so the set of states the agent sees, the actions it takes, and the rewards it receives forms our Markov decision process. Let's take a look at each of these components in turn. The states are just some convenient representation for the environment. So if we're talking about an agent trying to navigate a maze, the state is just the position of the agent within that maze. The state can be more abstract, like in the case of the lunar lander, where the state is an array of continuous numbers that describe the position of the lander, the velocity of the lander, its angle and angular velocity, as well as which legs are in contact with the ground. The main idea is that the state describes exactly what about the environment is changing at each time step. The rules that govern how the states change are called the dynamics of the environment. The actions are a little simpler to understand. In the case of a maze running robot, the actions would be just move up, down, left, and right. Pretty straightforward. In the case of the lunar lander, the actions consist of doing nothing, firing the main engine, firing the left engine, and firing the right engine. In both these cases, the actions are discrete, meaning they're either one or the other. You can't simultaneously not fire the engine and fire the right thruster, for instance. This doesn't have to be the case, though. Actions can, in fact, be continuous, and there are numerous videos on this channel dealing with continuous action spaces. Check out my videos on Soft Actor Critic, Deep Deterministic Policy Gradients, and Twin Delayed Deep Deterministic Policy Gradients. From the agent's perspective, it's seeing some set of states and trying to decide what to do. How is our agent to decide? The answer is something called the agent's policy. A policy is a mathematical function that takes states as inputs and returns probabilities as output. In particular, the policy assigns some probability to each action in the action space for each state. It can be deterministic, meaning the probability of selecting one of the actions is one and the others is zero, but in general, the probabilities will be somewhere between zero and one. The policy is typically denoted by the Greek letter pi, and learning to beat the environment is then a matter of finding the policy pi that maximizes the total return over time by increasing the chances of selecting the best actions and reducing the chances of selecting the wrong ones. The reward tells the agent exactly what is expected of it. These rewards can be either positive or negative, and the design of rewards is actually a tricky issue. Let's take the maze running robot. If we give it a positive reward for exiting the maze, and no other reward, what is the consequence of that? The consequence is that the agent has no motivation to solve the maze quickly. It gets the same reward if it takes the minimum number of steps, or if it takes 100 times that number. We typically want to solve the maze as quickly as possible, so this simple reward scheme fails. In this example, we have to give a penalty or reward of minus 1 for each step and a reward of 0 for exiting the maze. Then the agent has a strong motivation to solve the maze in as few steps as possible. This is because the agent will be trying to maximize a negative reward, meaning get it as close to zero as possible. So now that we have our basic definitions out of the way, we can start to think through the mathematics of the reinforcement learning problem. From the agent's perspective, it has no idea how its actions affect the environment, so we have to use a probability distribution to describe the dynamics. This probability distribution is denoted P of S prime and R given S and A, which just reads as the probability of ending up in state S prime and receiving reward R given we are in state S and take action A. In general, we won't know the value for this until we interact with the environment, and that's really part of solving reinforcement learning. Since we're dealing with probabilities, we have to start thinking in terms of expectation values. In general, the expectation value is calculated by taking into account all possible outcomes and multiplying the probability of that outcome by what you receive in that outcome. So in our Markov framework, the expected reward for a state and action payer is given by the expectation value of that reward, which is the sum over all possible rewards, the outcomes, multiplied by the sum over the probabilities of ending up in all possible resulting states. For a simple example, let's consider a simple coin toss game. If we flip a coin and it comes up heads, you get one point. If it comes up tails, you get minus one point. If we flip the coin two times, what is the expected number of points? 
it's the probability of getting heads multiplied by the reward for getting heads plus the probability of getting tails multiplied by the reward for getting tails. So it's 0 0.5 times 1 plus 0 0.5 times negative 1. This gives an expected reward of 0 points, which is what you would intuitively expect. This is a trivial example, but I hope it illustrates the point. We have to consider all possible outcomes, their probabilities, and what we would expect to receive in each of those outcomes. When we go to put theory in practice, we're going to be doing it in systems that are what we call episodic. This means that the agent has some starting state, and there is some terminal state that causes the gameplay to end. Of course, we can start over again with a new episode, but the agent takes no actions in this terminal step, and thus no future rewards follow. In this case, we're dealing with not just individual rewards, but with the sequence of rewards over the course of that episode. We call the cumulative reward the return, and it's usually denoted by the letter G. Now, this discussion is for games that are broken into episodes, but it would be nice if we could use the same mathematics for tasks that don't have a natural end. If we have a game that goes on and on, then the total sum of rewards will approach infinity. It's absurd to talk about maximizing total rewards in an environment where you can expect an infinite reward, so we have to do a little modification to our expression for the returns. We need to introduce the concept of discounting. We're going to reduce the contribution of each reward to the sum based on how far away in time it is from our current time step. We're going to use a power law to describe this reduction so that the reward gets reduced by some additional power of a new hyperparameter we'll denote as gamma. Gamma is between 0 and 1, so each time we increase the power, the contribution is reduced. If we introduce gamma into the expression for the return at time step t, we get that the return is just the sum over k of gamma to the k multiplied by the rewards at time t plus 1 plus k. Besides being a trick to make sure we can use the same mathematics for episodic and continuing tasks, discounting has a reasonable basis in first principles. Since our state transitions are defined in terms of unknown probabilities, we can't really say how certain each of those rewards were. States that we encounter further out in time become less and less certain, and so the rewards for reaching those states are also less and less certain. Thus, we shouldn't weight them as much as the reward we just received. If you've been following along carefully, something may not quite add up here. All of this math is for systems with a Markov property, which means that they depend only on the previous state in action, so why do we want to keep track of the entire history of rewards received? Well, it turns out that we don't have to. If you do some factoring in the expression for the return at time step t, you find that the return at time t is just the sum of the reward at time t plus 1 and the discounted return for the t plus 1 time step. This is a recursive relationship between returns at each time step. It's more consistent with the principles of the Markov decision process where we're just concerned with successive time steps. Now that we know exactly what the agent wants to maximize, the total returns, and then function for how it's going to act, the policy, we can actually start to make useful mathematical predictions. One quantity of particular interest is called the value function. It depends on the agent's policy pi and the current state of the environment and gives us the expectation value of the agent's returns starting from time t in state s, assuming it follows the policy pi. There's a comparable function for the value of state and action pairs, which tells us the value of taking action A in state S and then following the policy pi afterwards. It's called the action value function and it's represented by the letter Q. So how are these values calculated in practice? Well, in reality, we don't solve these equations, we estimate them. We can use neural networks to approximate the value or action value function because neural networks are universal function approximators. We sample rewards from the environment and use those to update the weights of our network to improve our estimate for the value or action value function. Estimating the value function is important because it tells us the value of the current state and the value of any other state the agent may encounter. Solving the reinforcement learning problem then becomes an issue of constructing a policy that allows the agent to seek out the most profitable states. The policy that yields the best value function for all states in the state space is called the optimal policy. In reality, it can be a set of policies, and they're all effectively equivalent. Various schemes to find these optimal policies exist, and one such scheme is called the actor-critic method. In actor-critic methods, we're using two deep neural networks. One of them is used to approximate the agent's policy directly, which we can do because it's just a mathematical function. Recall that the policy is just a probability distribution over the set of actions, where we take a state as input and output a probability of selecting each action. 
The other network, called the critic, is used to approximate the value function. The critic acts just like any other critic, telling the actor how good each action is based on whether or not the resulting state is valuable. The two networks work together to find out how best to act in the environment. The actor selects actions, the critic evaluates the states, and then the result is compared to the rewards from the environment. Over time, the critic becomes more accurate at estimating the values of states, which allows the actor to select the actions that lead to those states. From a practical perspective, we're going to be updating the weights of our deep neural network at each time step because actor-critic methods belong to a class of algorithms called temporal difference learning. This is just a fancy way of saying that we're going to be estimating the difference in values of successive states, meaning states that are one time step apart, hence temporal difference. Just like with any deep learning problem, we're going to be calculating cost functions. In particular, we're going to have two cost functions, one for updating our critic and the other for updating our actor. To calculate our costs, we want to generate a quantity we'll call delta, and it's just given by the sum of the current reward and the discounted estimate of the new state, and then subtracting off the value of the current state. Keep in mind that the value of the terminal state is identically zero, so we need a way to take this into account. The cost for the critic is going to be delta squared, which is kind of like a typical linear regression problem. The cost for our actor is a little more complex. We're going to multiply this delta by the log of the policy for the current state in action the agent took. The reason behind this is a little complex and is something I go into more detail about in my course, or you can look for it in the chapter on policy gradient methods in the free textbook by Sutton and Bardo. So let's talk implementation details. We're going to implement the following algorithm. Initialize a deep neural network to model the actor and critic. Repeat for a large number of episodes. Reset the score, terminal flag, and environment. While the state is not terminal, select an action based on the current state of the environment. Take the action and receive the new state, reward, and terminal flag from the environment. Calculate delta and use it to update the actor and critic networks. Set the current state to the new state and increment the episode reward by the score. After all the episodes have finished, plot the trend in scores to look for evidence of learning. There should be an overall increase in score over time. You will see lots of oscillations because actor critic methods aren't really stable, but the overall trend should be upward. Another thing you may see is that the score can go upward for a while and then fall off a cliff. This isn't uncommon because actor critic methods are quite brittle and they're really not the best solution for all cases, but they are a stepping stone to more advanced algorithms. Other important implementation details. You can use a single network for both the actor and critic. So you'll have common input layers and two outputs one for the actor and one for the critic. This has the benefit that we don't have to train two different networks to understand the environment. You can definitely use an independent actor and critic, it just makes the learning more difficult for an algorithm that is already pretty finicky. We'll let it play almost 2,000 games with a relatively large deep neural network, something like about 1,000 units in the first hidden layer and 500 units in the second. The hard part is going to be the actor. As I said earlier, the actor models the policy, which is a probability distribution. The actor layer will have as many outputs as there are actions, and we use a softmax activation because we're modeling probabilities, and they had better sum to 1. When selecting actions, we're going to be dealing with discrete action spaces, so this is what is called a categorical distribution. We're going to want to use the TensorFlow underscore probability package for the categorical distribution, and then use the probabilities generated by the actor layer to get this distribution, which we can then sample and use the built-in logprob function for our cost function. As far as the structure of our code, we're going to have a class for our actor critic network, and that will live in its own file. We'll also have a class for our agent, and that will have the functionality to choose actions, save models, and learn from its experience. That goes in a separate file. The main loop is pretty straightforward, but it does go in its own file as well. Okay, now that we have all the details out of the way, let's go ahead and get started coding this. So now that we have all of our lectures out of the way, we're going to go ahead and proceed with the coding. We're going to start with the networks. We begin as always with our imports. So we will need OS to handle file joining operations for model checkpointing. We will need Keras. And we will need our layers. which for this example is just going to be a dense layer. So we will have our actor critic network. And 
you see a case of converging um, engineering here where TensorFlow and PyTorch both have you derive your model class from the base model class. And we can go ahead and define our constructor. That will take a number of actions as input, the number of dimensions for the first fully connected layer, we will default that to 1024. And for the second, we will default it to 512. We will have a name for uh, model checkpointing purposes and a checkpoint directory. Very important, you must remember to do a make directory on this temp slash actor critic before you attempt to save a model, otherwise you're going to get an error. The first thing you want to do is call your super constructor and then go ahead and start saving your parameters. Now, also very important for our class that we've derived from the base class, in this case, the actor critic network class, we have to use model name instead of name because name is reserved uh, by the base class. So just be aware of that, not a huge deal. Checkpoint directory. And then we'll have our file. And that will be OS path join the directory name plus underscore AC. I like to use underscore algorithm, in this case AC for actor critic. In case you have one directory that you use for many different algorithms, if you're just using like say a working directory, you don't want to confuse the model types. Otherwise, if you have a good model saved, you don't want to override it with something else. Now we'll go ahead and define our layers. And that will be fully connected dense layers. Uh, the neat thing about Keras is that the number of input dimensions are inferred, so we don't have to specify it. That's why we don't have an input dims for our constructor. And it will output FC1 dims with an activation of ReLU. FC2 will be similar. And then we will have two separate outputs. So we have two uh, common layers and then two independent outputs. One for the value function and that is single valued with no activation. And the second is our policy pi. And that will output an actions with a soft max activation. Recall that the policy is just a probability distribution, so it assigns a probability to each action. And those probabilities have to add up to one because that's kind of what probabilities do, right? Next, we have to define our call function. This is really the feed forward. If you're familiar with that from PyTorch. So we'll just use some generic name like value. It doesn't really matter. And pass it through the second fully connected layer. And then get our value function and our policy pi. And then return both the value function and the policy pi. So that is really it for the actor critic network. All of the interesting functionality happens in the agent class. So let's go ahead and start writing the agent class. So we begin as always with our imports. We will need TensorFlow. We will need our optimizers. In this case, we're going to use an atom optimizer. probability. We will need TensorFlow probability to handle our categorical distribution to model our policy directly. Um, you have to do a pip install TensorFlow probability before you can run this. This is a separate package from TensorFlow. And we will also need our actor critic network. So let's go ahead and code up our agent. So our initializer is pretty straightforward. We will need some default learning rate. I'm going to use 0003. It doesn't really matter. I'm going to pass in a specific learning rate in the main file. Uh, we will have a gamma of 0 
and default in actions of some number like say two. So we're gonna go ahead and save our parameters. Recall that gamma is our discount factor. We're gonna need a variable to keep track of the last action we took. This will be a little bit more clear when we get to the learn function. Uh, and it has to do with the way we calculate the loss because we have to use a gradient tape for TensorFlow 2. It's just a bit of a workaround for how TensorFlow 2 does things. We need our action space for random uh, action selection. That's just a list of actions uh, from zero to an actions minus one. We need our actor critic. We want to make sure to specify the number of actions and we want to compile that model. So actor critic compile with an atom optimizer and learning rate defined by alpha. Next, we have the most basic functionality of our agent, the functionality to choose an action. And that takes the uh, current state of the environment as input, which we have to convert to a tensor. And in particular, we have to add an extra dimension, a uh, batch dimension. The reason being that the uh, deep neural network expects a batch of inputs. And so you have to have something other than a 1D array, it has to be two dimensional. So we just add an extra dimension along the uh, zeroth dimension. So then we will feed that through our deep neural network. We don't care about the value of the state for the purpose of choosing that action, so we just use a blank. Uh, and we will get the probabilities by passing the state through the actor critic network. And then we can use that output, the probabilities defined by our neural network, uh, to feed into the actual TensorFlow probabilities categorical distribution, and then use that to select an action by sampling that distribution and getting a log probability of selecting that sample. Sorry, that's TFP. Categorical and probabilities given by probs. And our actual action will be a sample of that distribution. Um, and we don't actually need the log prob at this stage. We will need the log prob when we calculate the loss function for our deep neural network, but we don't need it now. And it doesn't make sense, or rather it doesn't actually work to save it to a list, let's say for use later here, because this calculation takes place outside of the gradient tape. TensorFlow 2 has this construct of the gradient tape. It's pretty cool, it allows you to calculate gradients manually, which is really what we wanna do here. Uh, but anything outside of that tape doesn't get added to the calculation for backpropagation. So the log prop doesn't matter at this point, so why bother calculating it? One thing we do need, however, is the action that we selected. Uh, so we will save that in the action variable, and we will return a NumPy version of our action, because action is a uh, TensorFlow tensor, which is incompatible with the OpenAI gym. It does, however, take NumPy arrays. And we want the zeroth element of that because we added in a batch dimension for compatibility with our deep neural network. And a little bit confusing, uh, but that is what we have to deal with. Next, let's do a couple of bookkeeping functions to save and load models. Those don't take any inputs. And so it will save the weights of the network to the checkpoint file. We do the inverse operation to load models. And we will load weights from a checkpoint file. So that is it for the basic bookkeeping operations. Next, we have the real heart of the problem, the functionality to learn. Uh, so this will take a number of inputs. It will take the state, reward received, new state, and terminal flag as input. 
The first thing we want to do is convert each of those to uh, tensor flow tensors and make sure to add a batch dimension. And I like to be really pedantic with my data type, so I will cast it to TF float 32. And we don't have to add a batch dimension to the reward because it is not fed to a deep neural network. So now we get to calculate our actual gradients using something called the gradient tape. And we'll set persistent to true. And I'm not actually sure that's needed. Um, I'm going to go ahead and experiment with that. Uh, when we go ahead and run the code. Uh, but I have it that way. I might have just copied and pasted code from somewhere else. So let me double check. But we want to feed our uh, state, a new state through the actor critic network and get back our uh, quantities of interest. So we feed the current state and then the uh, new state. But for the new state, we don't care about the probabilities. We just care about the value. And that is for calculation of our delta. Uh, but for the calculation of our loss, we have to get rid of that batch dimension. So we have to squeeze these two parameters. And the reason you have to do that is because the loss works best if it's on a one dimensional quantity. Um, or rather a scalar value rather than a scalar value inside of brackets. So it has to be a scalar instead of a vector containing a single item. It's just something we have to do. I encourage you to play around with it to double check me on that. I move between uh, I move between distributions, excuse me, frameworks, so sometimes uh, stuff isn't always 100% necessary even if it doesn't hurt anything. So we need our action probabilities for the calculation of the log prob. TFP distributions categorical. And we define our probs by the output of our deep neural network. And then our log prob is action probs dot log prob of the self dot action. And this is the action that we saved up at the top when we calculate the action for the agent. So this is the most recent action. Um, then we calculate our delta. That is a reward plus gamma multiplied by the value of the new state times one minus int of done. And the reason for that is that the value of the terminal state is identically zero because no returns, no rewards follow the terminal state. So it has no future value. And then subtract off the state value. So our actor loss is minus log prob times that delta, and the critic loss is delta squared, and the total loss equals actor loss plus critic loss. Uh, and then we can go ahead and calculate our gradients. So our gradient is tape.gradient total loss with respect to the trainable variables. Optimizer apply gradients, and this expects a zip as input. So we're going to zip the gradient and the trainable variables. All right, and that is it for the actor critic functionality. So I'm going to come back to this in a few minutes to see if I need that persistent. I don't believe I do. I believe I need this in the case when we have. Um, if we were to have, say, separate actor and critic networks and had to calculate gradients with respect to two separate sets of trainable variables, I believe that's when the persistent equals true would be necessary. Um, and when, when we had um, coupling between the loss of one network and the other, uh, it's so that it keeps track of the gradients after it does the back propagation, uh, kind of like in PyTorch where it throws it away and you have to tell it to retain the graph. 
I'll double check on that though. So let's go ahead and write and quit. And then we're ready to go ahead and code up our main file. So with our imports, we will need Jim. We will need NumPy. Uh, we will need our agent. We will need um, our plot learning curve function. I'm not going to go into any detail on this. It's just a function to plot data using matplotlib with some labeled axes. It's nothing really worth going into. First thing we'll do is make our environment. And I'm using the cart poll because it runs very quickly and the actor critic method is quite brittle, uh, quite finicky. You will observe in many cases where it will achieve a pretty decent score and then fall off a cliff because the learning rate was just a little bit too high. So there are a number of problems with the algorithm and it's easiest to test in a very simple environment. In my course, we use the uh, lunar lander environment and I did more hyperparameter tuning to get it to actually uh, get pretty close to beating the environment, I believe. Uh, in this case, we won't quite beat it. We achieve a high score of like 140 points or so when beating it is 200. Uh, but I leave the exercise of hyperparameter tuning to you, the viewer. I gotta leave something for you to do as well, right? So we'll define our agent um, with a learning rate of 1 by 10 to the minus 5 and a number of actions defined by our environment action space underscore n. Then we'll have say 1800 games about 2000 with a file name of cartpole.png uh, I would encourage you if you do hyperparameter testing to put the uh, string representations of those hyperparameters here in the file name so that way when you look at it later you don't get confused and you know what hyperparameters were used to generate which plot. So our figure file is just plots plus the file name. I split it up, you don't have to do it that way. We want to keep track of the best score received and it'll default to the lowest range so that way the first score you get is better than the, the lowest of the range and so you save your models right away. An empty list to keep track of the score history, a boolean for whether or not we want to load a checkpoint. So if we're going to load a checkpoint then, we want to load models. And then finally we want to go ahead and start playing our games. We want to reset our environment, reset our terminal flag, set our score to zero. And while we're not done with the episode, we can choose an action. Uh, get the new state reward done and info from the environment. Increment our score. If we're not loading a checkpoint, then we want to learn. Either way, we want to set the current state to the new state. Otherwise, you will be constantly choosing an action based on uh, the initial state of the environment, which obviously will not work. Um, you also want to append the score to the score history for plotting purposes and calculate a score, uh, an average score of the previous, I don't know, say, 100 games and if that average score is better than your best score then set the best score to the average score and if we're not loading a checkpoint then save your models so this inner uh, conditional statement keeps you from overriding your models uh, that had your best scores uh, when you're actually testing if you just save the model every time, then you'd be overriding your best model with whatever, which you know may not be the best model. So at the end, um, if we're not loading a checkpoint, uh, actually we can just plot either way. Let's do that. It's got our x axis and plot learning curve x score figure file. Okay, 
Now I have to do a make dir on plots temp. Um, did I call it uh, temp slash actor critic? Otherwise, this stuff won't work. And you also want to do a pip install flow TensorFlow probability because that is a separate package. Of course, I already have it. Uh, so let's go ahead and try to run this and see if I made any typos. I'm certain, almost certain I did. So it says something something is not callable. Oh, that's because I have forgotten my uh, multiplication sign. So that is in line 49. Yeah, it thinks I'm trying to call something here when I really want to multiply. Oh, you know what I did forget? One thing I did forget, uh, of course, is <laughs> uh, down here I forgot my debug statement. So let's do this. That's pretty funny. Episode I score percent one F. Always have to forget something, of course. Okay, there we go. So one other thing I want to do is come back here to actor critic and get rid of this persistent equals true. I don't think I actually need this. Sometimes I just copy and paste code. And then as I'm doing the video, I realize, oh, hey, I don't always need all of that stuff. Okay, so yeah, it does run. Alrighty, so I'm going to go ahead and switch over to another window where I have let this finish up uh, because there's no point letting it run for another 1800 games. So let's go ahead and check that out. So here you can see the output of the other 1800 games I ran, and it does achieve a score of around 167, 168, about 170 points or so, which is almost beating the environment. It's pretty close. If you take a look at the learning plot here, you can see that it has an overall, overall upward trend and it's linear. And the reason I don't let it continue is because as I alluded to in the lecture, um, these models are very brittle. And so sometimes you can get on a very narrow slice of parameter space where your model is doing well and any small step out of that range blows up the model. Uh, one thing to fix that is replay memory allows you to get a broader sampling of, of experiences and get a little bit more stable learning but that doesn't work by bolting it directly onto actor critic methods at least from my experience I've tried it I have a video on that I wasn't able to get it to work uh, maybe some of you can that would be fantastic if you could but in my case I didn't get it to work I thought it would work it does not and in fact there's a whole separate algorithm called actor critic with experience replay uh, that deals with bolting experience replay onto vanilla actor critic methods so I hope this was helpful it's pretty hard to give a really solid overview in like a 30 40 minute uh, YouTube video, but it um, serves to illustrate some of the finer points of actor critic methods and some of the foundational points of deep reinforcement learning in general. In my courses, I go into much more depth, and in particular, I show you how to actually read papers, how to turn papers into code, a useful skill that's really hard to find anywhere else on YouTube or Udemy. So if you like the content, make sure to leave a like, subscribe if you haven't already, uh, and leave a comment down below with any questions, comments, criticisms, concerns, and I will see you in the next video. Oh, really quick, before we do, let's check in on the other terminal to make sure it's actually learning. So here is the output, and you can see uh, as it's going along, it is saving some models, and the score is generally trending upward over time. Um, and that's why you get the saving models because the score is best than the last best score. So we didn't make any fundamental errors in our code. Uh, if it doesn't achieve the same result, that isn't entirely surprising because there is a significant amount of run to run variation. Uh, but um, the code is functional. It's up on my GitHub. If you want to go ahead, check it out. I'll leave it a link in the description. See you in the next one. Welcome to a crash course in deep deterministic policy gradients or DDPG for short. 
In this lecture, we're going to briefly cover the fundamental concepts and some notes on the implementation so that the stuff we do in the coding portion isn't such a mystery. So why do we even need DDPG in the first place? Well, DDPG exists to answer the question of how do we apply reinforcement learning to continuous action spaces? This is particularly important in something like, say, robotics, where we are applying continuous voltages to electronic motors that cause the robot to move in three-dimensional space. Now, you may think, well, why can't we just use something awesome like deep Q learning? And that's not such a terrible idea. Uh, however, the problem is it doesn't work. In particular, Q-Learning can't handle continuous action spaces. If you've coded up a Q-Learning network, a deep Q-Learning network that is, you know that it outputs discrete numbers as actions. And of course, that doesn't cut it when you're dealing with continuous action spaces. Now, you might think, why can't we just discretize our action space? And that's not such a bad idea, but the problem is it doesn't work. And the basic idea here is you have some finite interval for your action space, and then you just divide it up into a number of discrete chunks. And then every time uh, you want to output the action in that chunk, you just use uh, that discrete integer. The problem with this is that these robots tend to have many degrees of freedom, meaning they can move in many different directions in space, right? They can rotate around axes, multiple axes in general. They can move up, down, left, and right. They can rotate. And so your number of discrete actions approaches the thousands very, very quickly. And so Q-learning, while it does handle discrete action spaces, doesn't handle large numbers of discrete actions particularly well. However, that doesn't mean that the innovations from Q-learning can't be applied to actor critic methods, and in fact they can. And that was the motivation behind the work done in the DDPG paper. In particular, we're going to make use of a replay memory, where instead of just learning from the most recent state uh, transition that the agent has experienced, it's going to keep track of the sum total of its experiences and then randomly sample that memory at each time step to get some batch of memories to update the weights of its deep neural networks. The other innovation is the use of target networks. So in Q-learning, we have to do two different things. We have to um, use a network to determine the action to take, and then we have to use a network to determine the value of that action. And that uh, value is used to update the weights of the deep neural network. Now, if you're using the same network to do both things, the problem is you end up chasing your tail. You end up chasing a rapidly moving target because at each time step those weights are getting updated, and so the evaluation of similar actions excuse me, the evaluation of similar states uh, changes rapidly over the course of the simulation, causing the learning to be unstable. The solution to this is to keep two networks, one of which you use, the online network is called to choose actions at each time step, and then another network called a target network to evaluate the values of those actions when performing the update for your deep neural network. Now, in this case, you will be doing a a hard update of your target network. So every, let's say, thousand steps, it's a hyperparameter of your agent, but a typical value would be a thousand steps. You would take the values for the network parameters from the online network and directly copy those over to the target network. It's a, what's called a hard update. The authors of the DDPG paper took inspiration from this, but instead of doing a direct uh, hard update, they used something called a soft copy of the target networks. All this means is that we're going to be doing some uh, multiplicative constant uh, for our update, and we're going to be using a new hyperparameter called tau, and it's going to be a very small number of order 0 0.001. It's also worth noting that we're going to have more than one target network here, and the reason we need more than one target network is because DDPG is a type of actor critic method. And so you have two distinct networks, one for the actor and one for the critic. And in fact, in this implementation, we're gonna have four different networks, one actor, one critic, and then one target actor and one target critic. Now, for simple problems with discrete action spaces, you can get away with having a single network where the lower layers learn the features of the environment and the upper layer splits off into outputting the Act, uh, the critic evaluation as well as the um, output for the actor network. But in this case, we do in fact want two totally distinct networks as well as two copies of those for the target networks. 
The basic idea is that our critic network is going to evaluate state and action pairs. And so we're going to be passing in states and actions and it's going to say, hey, given that state, the action we took was pretty good or maybe that action was pretty terrible. We should probably do better next time. And similarly, the actor is going to decide what to do based on the current state or whatever state we pass into it. Something worth noting is that this network is going to output action values. In other words, a continuous number that corresponds to the direct input for our OpenAI Gym environment, rather than outputting probabilities. So if you've been doing this for a while, you may know that the uh, policy is actually a probability distribution. It is a function that tells us what is the probability of selecting any action from the action space given an input of a state or set of states. Uh, the deterministic part comes from the fact that DDPG uh, outputs the action values themselves and it's deterministic in the sense that if I pass in uh, one state over and over again, I'm going to get the same action value out every single time. Now, this does have a bit of a problem. So the problem is that the agent has something called an explore exploit dilemma. And this is present in all reinforcement learning problems. It's a fundamental concept in the field. The basic idea is that our agent is attempting to build out a model of the world. The agent wants to know how to maximize its total score over time, but it starts out knowing absolutely nothing about its world. It has to figure out how states transition from one into another and how its actions affect those states, and in particular how its actions give it rewards. So it starts out knowing none of this and has to build out that model over time. The problem is the agent can never be quite sure that its model is accurate. No matter how long it spends playing the game, interacting with the environment, it isn't 100% certain that the action it thinks is best is actually the best. Perhaps there's some other strategy, some other action out there that is significantly better. And the degree to which the agent takes off optimal actions uh, is called the explore exploit dilemma. So of course, taking an off optimal action is called exploration and taking the optimal action is called exploitation because you're just exploiting the best known action. And this is a dilemma that is present in all reinforcement learning problems. And the solution here is to take the output of our uh, actor network and apply some extra noise to it. Now in our implementation, we're gonna be using simple Gaussian noise because it's sufficient for the problem at hand. However, in the original paper, the authors use something called ornstein uhlenbeck noise. Uh, it's a model of Gaussian processes and physical systems. It's overly complex and it's not needed, so we're not going to implement it. Although in the course, I do show you how to implement it exactly, but for YouTube, it's not really necessary. And in fact, when other authors implement DDPG, they just throw that right out the window because it's pretty dumb. Next is the update rule for our actor network, and it is somewhat complex. So I'm going to show you the equation, and then I'm going to walk you through it. So this is the update for the actor network. And don't panic, this is a little bit easier than it looks at first glance. So from left to right, we have the NABLA operator, that is the gradient. And the subscript there, theta super mu, means that we wanna take the gradient of the cost function j with respect to the network parameters of our actor network, where the actor is denoted by mu and its parameters are denoted by theta super mu. So theta super q means the um, parameters for the critic network where the critic is denoted by Q. And that's just given by an expectation value or an average uh, of the gradient of the critic network uh, where we're going to input some states and actions where the actions are chosen according to the current policy. Okay. So in practice what this means is what we're going to do is randomly sample states from the agent's memory. Now the memory keeps track of everything we want. It keeps track of the states the agent saw, the actions it took, and the uh, new states that resulted from those actions as well as the reward the agent received at that time step. And the terminal flag to determine whether or not the episode ended on the new time step. So the, the memory uh, keeps track of all of that, but here we just want to sample the states the agent saw, okay? And then we're going to use the actor network to determine what actions it thinks it should take based on those states. Now these actions will probably probably be different from the actions we have stored in memory, and that's okay. This is off policy, meaning we're using uh, a separate policy to gather data and uh, use that data to update 
um, a different policy, the current policy. So it's okay that these actions don't match. Don't worry about that. It all works out in the end. Uh, then you, then the next thing you want to do is plug those actions from the actor into the critic network along with the states we sampled from the memory and get the value for the critic network, what it thinks that state action pair is worth. And then we're going to use the gradient tape from TensorFlow 2 to take the gradient of the uh, actor network, excuse me, the critic network with respect to the parameters from the actor network. And we can do that because they're coupled through the selection of the actions uh, based on the actor network. Okay, so it's a little bit complex. It's much easier in code. Just in code, you sample the, the states, then you get the actions based on the critic network, and then plug those states and actions into the um, critic network, and then you just have the loss proportional to that. It's actually much simpler in code than it is on paper, but that's the basic idea. So then the next question is, how do we implement our critic network? Well, fortunately, it's a little bit more straightforward and it's more reminiscent of deep Q learning. So we have this relatively simple loss function that is the uh, mean squared error between this, uh, this target value y sub i and this uh, q for the current state and action. So what we're going to do here is randomly sample states, new states, actions, and rewards. And then we want to use the target actor network to determine the actions for the new states. Then plug those actions into the target critic network to get your y and multiply it by the discount factor gamma and add in the reward from that time step which you sampled from the memory. And then that is the target, uh, the value we want to shift the estimates for our critic towards. And then we want to plug the states and actions into the critic network uh, in other words, the actions the agent actually took that we sampled from our memory. This is in contrast to the update for the actor network. And take that difference with the target. And then we're going to input it into the mean squared error loss function for TensorFlow 2. So in code, this is going to be relatively straightforward as well. We're going to have a sample function to get states, new states, actions, and rewards. We're going to plug in the new states into the target actor network, get some output. We're going to plug that output into the target critic um, to get our target y and note it is s sub i plus one so it is the new states that we get from our uh, memory buffer and then we're going to plug the current states and actions from our memory into the critic and take the difference with the target so it only looks kind of scary on paper when you see it written in code it'll make much more sense so the other piece of the puzzle is how we're going to handle the updates of our target networks so at the very beginning of the program, we are going to initialize our actor and critic networks with some parameters. Of course, they're going to be random. And then we're going to directly copy those parameters over to our target actor and target critic networks. That'll be the only time in the simulation that we do an exact hard copy. Every other time step, we're going to use the soft update rule. So here you have the two parameters, theta, Q, uh, theta super Q prime, so the weights of the target critic network and theta uh, super mu prime which is the weights of the target actor network. You're going to update those with tau multiplied by the respective value of the online network, the critic or the actor, and add in 1 minus tau times the current value of your uh, target actor or target critic network. And so this will be a very slowly changing function because it's going to be some small number tau multiplied by some parameters plus 1 minus tau, which is approximately 1 multiplied by the current value. So it's going to be approximately equal to its last time step, just plus minus a little bit. So it's relatively straightforward. We'll see it in code. It's not all that bad. So then the next question is, what data structures are we going to need for all of this? So we're going to use a class to encapsulate our replay buffer, and that will use uh, NumPy arrays. There are a myriad of different ways to handle the replay buffer. I like the NumPy arrays because it's easy to enumerate, it's easy to know what is being stored where, um, and it makes for an easier YouTube video because it's easier for people to see what's going on. If you have a different way of doing it, by all means use that. It's not uh, something for which there is only one right answer. 
We will need uh, one class each for the actor network and critic network, and those will be handled using the TensorFlow 2 framework. These will have the functionality to perform a forward pass as well as the usual initializer function. We will also need an agent class to tie everything together. The agent will have um, a functionality for the memory, right? It will have a memory buffer to, to store memories. It will have the actor network, critic network, target actor, target critic network. It will also have a function for choosing actions based on the current state of the environment. Uh, and that will involve passing a state through the actor network, getting the output and adding in some Gaussian noise. It will also have functionality to learn from the uh, memories it has sampled and it will also have functionality for checkpointing models because this can take quite a while to train for complex environments. We're going to use a simple environment, but if you want to go ahead and try something more complex, uh, the checkpointing functionality will come in handy. Finally, we will need a main loop to train our network and to evaluate its performance. All right, that has been a very brief introduction. Let's go ahead and get into the coding portion of our video. All right, now that the lecture is out of the way, it is time for a shameless plug. In my courses, I show you how to go from paper to code rather than relying on someone else to break down the material in the paper for you. It's the best way to gain independence and to level up your skill as a machine learning engineer. Provided through Udemy, they are on sale right now. Check the link in the description below. Let's go ahead and start with our buffer. So the point of our buffer is to store the states actions, rewards, new states, and terminal flags that the agent encounters uh, in its adventures. And we're going to use, as I stated in the lecture, NumPy for this. It's going to be relatively straightforward. The reason I use NumPy is because it makes it much more clear what everything is. It's just a little bit simpler and cleaner from an implementation perspective, although it is by no means the only way to do things. So the first thing we'll need is a max size. The memory is bounded and input shape from our environment and uh, a number of actions for our action space. Now in this case, since it is a continuous action space, number of actions is a bit of a misnomer. What it really means is number of components to the action. The purpose of the mem size is that the memory cannot be unbounded and our memory will have the property that as we uh, exceed the memory size, we will overwrite our earliest memories with new ones. So for that, we will need a memory counter. It starts out as zero. And then we can go ahead and start with our actual memories. Uh, first, we have a memory size, excuse me, a state memory. And that will be in shape memory size by input shape. Uh, we have the new state memory, which is in the same dimensions. We need an action memory. And that will be and shape mem size by n actions. And one thing I want to make clear, there was a question on the Discord server. By the way, uh, also check the link in the description for the Discord server. We have many really bright people in there talking about a lot of complex stuff. It's a great little community. I would encourage you to join. But the question popped up whether or not I'm writing this stuff on the fly, and I am not. I don't know if that was clear. You can often see me looking off to the side here. That's because it's not a second monitor. It's just a really large monitor where I have a second window open with the already completed code. And if you've seen my tutorials before, you know that I make a lot of typos. And so the probability of making a logical error where I have state instead of new state, for instance, is incredibly high. And that when you are making YouTube videos is enormously painful to try to do everything from memory and then swap states with new states and then not have it work and then have to go back and re-record. <clears throat> so it's just easier to have the already written code and I'm kind of reading off of it as I go along. And occasionally I'll make modifications. So um, all the code is mine, but it is not written on the fly. I just want to make that clear. Next, we'll need a reward memory, and that is just shape mem size, and that is just going to be an array of floating point numbers. And we will need a terminal memory. And that will be uh, n type uh, Boolean. Um, I use Boolean because in, um, in PyTorch we can use. Uh, masking of tensors. I don't think it works in uh, TensorFlow, so I'll have to do something slightly different 
uh, in our learning function, but I will note that when we get there. We'll need a function to store a transition, where a transition is the state, action, reward, new state, and terminal flag. Uh, the first thing we want to do is determine what is the position of the first available memory. And that's given by the modulus of the current memory counter and the memory size. Once we have the index, we can go ahead and start saving our transitions. Yeah, see I've already made a mistake here. Then we have action memory. And terminal memory. Um, and we want to increment our memory counter by one. Now, one thing I don't think I stated in the lecture, the purpose of this terminal memory is that the value of the terminal state is zero uh, because no future rewards follow from that, that terminal state. We have to reset the episode back to the initial state. Uh, so we have to have a way for accounting for that in our learning function. And we do that by using the uh, terminal flags, <clears throat> excuse me, by using the terminal flags as a multiplicative constant in our learning function. Next, we need a function to sample our buffer, and that will take a batch size as input. We want to know how much of our memory we filled up because we have a memory and it starts out as entirely zeros, and until we fill up that memory, some portion of it will be nothing but zeros. It doesn't do us any good to learn from a bunch of zeros, so we have to know how much of the memory we've actually filled up. And this is given by the minimum of the memory counter or the mem size. Then we can take a batch of numbers, random choice, max mem, batch size. And, you know, I think I want to pass the replace equals false flag in there. I don't have that in my cheat sheet, but the point of passing in replace equals false is that once a memory is sampled, uh, from that range, it will not be sampled again. That prevents you from double sampling memories. If you're dealing with a really large memory buffer, the probability of sampling two memories, two identical memories is astronomically small, but up until that point, it's non-negligible, so we should be careful. Then we want to go ahead and dereference our NumPy arrays. And we will return those at the end. That is a typo. All right, that wraps up our um, replay buffer class. Now we're going to go ahead and handle the network classes. All right, so our imports are relatively light. We will need OS for file path joining operations for model checkpointing. We will need the base TensorFlow package. We will need Keras, and we will need layers. Now. We're going to be dealing with a very simple environment, so we just need a dense layer. We don't need any convolutional layers. <clears throat> so we will start with a critic network. And that derives from the keras.model class. That will take a number of actions, number of uh, fully connected dims, a name, and a checkpoint directory. Now, very important, you must do a make dir temp and make dir uh, temp slash ddpg before we run this so that you can actually save your models. Otherwise, you'll get an error. Um, let's go ahead and call our super constructor. And then start saving our variables.
we have to call our model model name due to uh, the TensorFlow package keeping name as a reserved variable. You can't just say self.name. It'll give you an error. Not a huge deal, just something to be aware of. Then we'll have our checkpoint file. And Keras models get saved with a .h5 extension. And I throw in the model name because we're gonna to want to uh, distinguish between the target and regular networks. And I add an, an underscore DDPG because if you do development in a single directory, then you don't want to overwrite models from say TD3 with DDPG models, vice versa. Uh, it's just a way of keeping all of your models uh, distinct and very uh, secure. Next we need to define our network. So our first fully connected layer will output uh, self.fc1 dims with a ReLU activation. Then we'll have fc2 dims ReLU. And our final output layer is single valued with no activation. A couple of things to note here is that in the original paper, the authors used batch normalization. Turns out that isn't necessary. In the course, I show you how to implement that, but it's just an uh, overly complex implementation. It doesn't actually add much to it. Um, they also do a number of uh, kind of tweaks with the initialization of the layers. We're not going to do that here. I show you in the course, but it's not really necessary. Next, we need our call function. This is the forward propagation operation. And this is the critic, so it takes a state and action as input. So we want to pass the concatenated uh, state and action through our first fully connected layer and we'll concatenate it along the first axis. Um, the zeroth axis is the batch. And then we will pass the output of that through the second fully connected layer and we will go ahead and get our Q value out and return it. That is it for the actor network, excuse me, critic network. Very, very straightforward. Next, we have our actor network. And that is pretty similar. Equals 512 and actions. I'll just default the two name equals actor and uh, checkpoint dir. And you know what? Now that I'm looking at this, um, we don't need the number of actions here, do we? Because we don't use it. Let's get rid of that. Yeah, I'm looking at my cheat sheet as well. These are some of the modifications I make as I go along. Sometimes I'll have um, I'll have stuff that doesn't always make 100% sense. And then when I do the YouTube video, I go ahead and rectify it. So we'll go ahead and call our super constructor and save our values. This time we will need the number of actions because the uh, critic network does, excuse me, the actor network does need to know how many actions it has. And we will need our checkpoint dir. And then our model is going to be pretty similar to the um, critic network. It's going to be a number of fully connected layers with a ReLU activation. Now, we don't want a null activation here, no activation or linear activation, if you will. We do want an actual function here. And what we want is a function that is bounded between plus and minus one. And the reason is that 
most of our environments have an action boundary of plus or minus one. However, if the action boundary is larger than plus or minus one, uh, it's easy to get the um, action within that range by multiplying a function which is bounded by plus or minus one by the upper bound of the environment. So if your environment has a bound of plus or minus two, then you would just multiply the tan hyperbolic function, which is bound to plus or minus one by two. Um, <clears throat> Next, we have our call function. We'll go ahead and call it prob. It's a bit of a misnomer. These aren't really probabilities. And then we will get our mu, which is from the paper. It's our actual action. Now, if you had um, not plus or minus, one can multiply here. You can multiply it there, or you can multiply it in the agent class when we do the uh, choose action function. Either way is logically the same. I would probably do it in the agent class uh, just for my own personal preferences. But either way, you want to multiply the uh, output of the deep neural network by the bounds if those bounds are not plus or minus one. All right, that is actually it for the network classes. Let's go ahead and code up the agent class and tie all of this together. Okay, our imports will be quite numerous. We will need NumPy, TensorFlow. We will need uh, Keras. We will need our optimizers. which we will add them for this project. We will need our replay buffer and uh, we will need our actor and critic network. Did I misspell that? No, nope, that looks correct. So here's our agent class and we have an initializer and that will take uh, input dims uh, a learning rate for the actor network alpha, a learning rate for the critic network beta. Uh, these are distinct, they're not the same. And in fact, the critic network can get, can get away with a slightly higher learning rate than the actor network. And that is because in general in policy gradient type methods, uh, the policy approximation is a little bit a little bit more sensitive to the perturbation and parameters. So if you wiggle around the parameters of your deep neural network, you can get big changes in the output of the actor network. And so it has to have a slightly smaller learning rate with respect to, say, like the critic network. Uh, we will need our environment for the max and min actions because, as I said in the lecture, we're going to be adding noise to the output of our deep neural network for, for some exploration. And we have to clip that into the max and min actions for environment so we don't trigger an error when we try to pass that action into the OpenAI gym. We will need a gamma, and that is the discount factor for our update equation, number of actions, a max size for our replay buffer, defaulted to a million, a default value for our soft update of 0 0.005, that's from the paper, a default for FC1 and FC2. In the paper, they actually use 400 and 300. I'm gonna go ahead and do that now rather than in the main program. That makes life a little easier. A batch size for our memory sampling and a noise for our exploration. So let's go ahead and save our parameters. Gamma and tau. We can instantiate our memory. We can save our batch size. and our noise. And then we'll go ahead and get the maximum and minimum actions for our um, environment. Then we can instantiate our actual networks. So our actor our critic
our target actor. And our target critic. That is it for our networks. Now we have to actually compile those. We will use our um, Atom optimizer, learning rate defined by alpha. Similarly for our critic network, we will give it a learning rate of beta. And then we have our target networks. That is a bit of a misnomer because we aren't going to be calling the, um, we aren't going to be doing gradient descent for these networks. We're going to be doing the soft network update, but we have to compile the network. So we have to pass it a learning rate. It's just a feature of TensorFlow. Don't get confused if down in the learn function we don't actually uh, call an update for the uh, loss function for these target actor and target critics. Then we have to call our update network parameters function. And this is where we do the hard copy of the initial weights of our actor and critic network to the target actor and target critic network. And I'm passing in tau equals one to facilitate that hard copy. Let's go ahead and write that function now. And so we have to deal with the base case of uh, the hard copy on the first call of the function and the soft copy on every other time we call the function. So if tau is none, in other words, uh, if we don't supply a value for tau, then just use the default defined in the constructor. And so you notice here, the first time I call it, tau is one, so tau is not none. So we're gonna be using a value of one for tau instead of the 0 0.005. So we'll say weights is an empty list. And our targets will be target actor weights, or I weight, We're going to iterate over the actor weights and append the, the weight for the actor multiplied by tau plus targets sub i, now which is the weight from the target actor times one minus tau. And then after we go through every iteration of the loop, we're going to set our weights for the target actor to that list of weights. So in the first iteration, tau starts out as one. And so you have uh, weight times tau, which is one. So just the actor weight plus uh, the target actor weight multiplied by one minus tau, which is one minus one or zero. So on the first iteration, we get a hard copy. And then we do the same thing for the critic network. And that is all we need to do for our soft update rule. So now we'll go ahead and write an interface function for our agent's memory. They'll take a state action reward new state and terminal flag as input. And that will just call the store transition function. And this is just good clean coding hygiene. Uh, it's an interface function when you have uh, interdependent classes. In theory, the uh, we shouldn't be able to call the agent.memory.store transition from anywhere else in the program except within its own member function. It's just basic um, object-oriented programming stuff. 
Now let's deal with model checkpointing. And we'll say self.actor save weights actor checkpoint file. And likewise for our other networks. That should be a dot, not an underscore. I think I've done that before, that specific mistake. Of course, I have an extra space here. And the load models function it's just the inverse operation. We say, what is it, self.actor.load weights dot checkpoint file. Critic checkpoint file, yep. Okay, that is it for our basic bookkeeping type functions. Now we can get into the functionality for choosing an action. And that will take the observation of the current state of our environment as input, as well as a flag I call evaluate. Uh, this has to do with um, training versus testing our agent. Remember that we use the addition of noise for the uh, exploration part of the explore exploit dilemma. If you're just testing the agent to see how well it learned, you don't necessarily want to add that noise. Uh, you can just do the uh, purely deterministic output of your actor network. And I facilitate that with a Boolean flag here. First thing you want to do is convert our state to a tensor. And we have to add an extra dimension to our uh, observation to give it a batch dimension. It's just what the deep neural networks expect as input. They expect a batch dimension. And I specify a float32 data type to be pedantic. And then we pass the state through the actor network to get the actions out. If we are not evaluating, in other words, if we are training, uh, then we want to get some random normal noise in the shape of self.n actions uh, with a mean of 0, 0.0 and a standard deviation of whatever our noise parameter is. Now, it's entirely possible that the output of our deep neural network was 1 or 0 0.999, and then when you add in the noise, you're adding in something like, let's say, 0 0.1, and you end up with an action that is outside the bound of your environment, because perhaps it's bounded by plus or minus 1. And so you want to go ahead and clip that to make sure you don't pass any legal action to your environment. So we'll say actions equals tf clip by value. It's a function we want. Actions. And that is between self min action and max action. And then we want to return the zeroth element because it is a tensor and the value is the zeroth element, which is a NumPy array. Then we want our learning function, and this is where the bulk of the functionality comes in. And right away we are faced with a, a dilemma. So what if it's the case that we haven't filled up at least batch size of our memories? So remember that the memory starts out as all zeros, and if you've only filled up, let's say, 10 memories, you don't really want to sample those 10 memories, uh, um, you know, batch number of times, batch size number of times. Uh, so you can just go ahead and say, well, I'm not going to learn. I'm going to wait until I fill up my memory into a, uh, until at least batch size number of memories. Alternatively, you can... Uh, play batch size number of steps with random actions uh, and then call the learn function. That's another solution as well and they're both valid.
I just find this to be a little bit more straightforward. So then we have to go ahead and sample our memory. And then we can go ahead and convert these to tensors. New states. That is singular, not plural. And we don't have to convert the uh, terminal flags to a tensor because we're not going to be doing tensor operations with it. We're going to be doing regular NumPy array type operations. So we're going to use a gradient tape for the calculation of our gradients. If you're not familiar with the gradient tape, the basic idea is we're going to go ahead and load up operations onto our computational graph for calculation of gradients. So when we call the choose action function above, uh, those operations aren't stored anywhere that is uh, used for calculation of gradients. So it's effectively detached from the graph. So only things within this context manager are used for the calculation of our gradient. And so this is where we're going to stick the update rule from our lecture. So let's go ahead and start with the critic network, where we recall that we have to take the new states and pass it through a target actor network, and then get the target critics evaluation of the new states and those target actions. And then we can um, calculate the target, which is the reward, plus gamma multiplied by the uh, critic value for the new states times one minus a terminal flag, and then take the mean squared error between the target value and the critic values for the states and actions the agent actually took. So let's go ahead and write that out. So target actions is given by our target actor, what it thinks we should do for the new states. And the critic value for those new states is gonna be given by the target critic evaluation of those new states and target actions and squeezed along the first dimension. Uh, we have to put in this squeeze because we have the batch dimension and it doesn't actually learn if you pass in the batch dimension. And I feel like I am missing, there we go, a parenthesis. Uh, so we'll have a squeeze everywhere that we had to actually pass stuff through the network. So then the critic value, which is the value of the current states, uh, the original states and the actions the agent actually took during the course of the episode, is given by the squeezed output of the critic or the states and actions along the first dimension. Yeah, I guess that is right. Yep. And then we have our target, and that's reward plus gamma times this critic value underscore times one minus done. So this one minus done is one minus true or false. So when the episode is over, done is true. And so you have one minus one or zero. And so the target for the terminal new state is just the reward. Whereas for every other state, it is reward plus the discounted value of the resulting state according to the target critic network. I'm sorry if you can hear the landscapers outside. It's Tuesday, they're doing the neighbor's yard. Uh, hopefully the noise suppression filter takes care of that, but if not, I apologize. Uh, next, we have a critic loss, and that's the mean squared error between our target and the critic value. Outside of the context manager, we wanna go ahead and calculate the gradients. So we'll say critic network gradient was tape dot gradient critic loss self critic trainable variables so it is the gradient of the critic loss with respect to those uh, critics trainable variables and then we want to uh, apply our gradients so our optimizer 
dot apply gradients and then expects a zip as input we want to zip up the critic network gradient and the critic trainable variables and that is it for the critic loss uh, now we have the actor loss so with we want to do essentially the same thing we want our context manager gradient tape as tape then we say new policy actions actor states so this is the these are the actions according to the actor based on its current set of weights not based on the weights it had at the time of whatever memory we stored in the uh, agent's memory so then we have our actor loss and that is the negative of the critic output of the states and the new policy actions uh, it's negative because we're doing gradient ascent uh, in policy gradient methods you typically want to take the uh, you don't want to do a gradient descent because that would minimize the total score over time you want to maximize total score over time so you do gradient ascent Gradient ascent is just a negative of gradient descent, so we stick a negative sign in here. And then our loss is just the reduced mean of that actor loss. Uh, and then we can go ahead and calculate our gradients and apply them. So the actor network gradient is tape.gradient of the actor loss with respect to the actor trainable variables. And this is how we're going to get that gradient of the critic loss with respect to the mu parameters of theta super mu is by taking this actor loss, which is proportional to the output of the critic network. And, uh, and that is coupled, the gradient is non-zero because it has this dependency on the output of our actor network. So the dependence that gives you a non-zero gradient comes from the fact that we are taking actions with respect to the actor network which is calculated according to theta, theta super mu and uh, that gets fed forward through here through the critic network that's what allows you to take the gradient of the output of the critic network with respect to the variables of the actor network it's how we get that coupling and if you read the paper they actually apply the chain rule and you get the gradient of the uh, critic network and the gradient of the actor network. This form is actually easier to implement in code. That's why I do it based on the first equation, uh, not the second equation in the paper. It's just easier to do, so why not do it the easy way? Then you want to apply those gradients, which again takes a zip as input. We want to apply uh, zip up our actor gradient network and the actor dot trainable variables. One other thing I want to point out is that this actor dot trainable variables we didn't define. It comes from the fact that we derive our actor network class from the keras dot model class. Um, it just comes from the properties of object oriented programming. Once we have updated the main networks, we want to go ahead and perform the soft update of our target networks. And since this is not the first time we're calling the function, that gets no input, so it will use the default value for tau of 0 0.005. And that is it, 113 lines for our agent class. Now we're ready to write up the main loop and test it out to see how well it does. Okay, I have an error. It says keyword cannot be an expression. Uh, let's see, rewards tf convert to tensor. Where have I gone? wrong ah right here it's a period instead of a comma all right now we're good so let's go ahead and start with our imports we have jim we have numpy we have our agent and Our plot learning curve so uh, go to my github do a git clone and get those utils it is just a matplotlib function to uh, plot our learning curve which is the score versus time the running average of the previous hundred games uh, over time it's nothing magical I don't go over it because it's uh, relatively trivial and doesn't really contribute to your understanding you can just do a plot of the scores over time to see if it's learning So. 
So we start with our making our environment and we will use the pendulum and we'll instantiate our agent by getting the observation space from our environment or our input dims passing in the environment shape and we will use the default value for our um, noise and every other parameter because those were good defaults. We'll let it play 250 games. Let's go ahead and define a figure file. Pendulum.png. We need to keep track of the best score. That's the lower bound of our reward range. We need to keep track of the history of scores the agent receives and a load checkpoint that'll be false that's if we want to uh, set up our training versus testing if we're going to load that checkpoint then um, we want to set number of steps to zero while n steps is less than agent dot batch size uh, what we're doing here okay so i should explain this so my understanding, and this could be wrong, if it's wrong, drop a comment down below to correct me. I don't profess to know everything about TensorFlow, but from what I've read uh, from uh, Google, the model loading is set up such that you have to call the learning function um, before you can load your model. Uh, and that's because when you instantiate the agent, you aren't actually loading any values onto the graph. And so it's basically an empty network. There are no values loaded into that network. It doesn't load any values until you try to do something with it. And so we're going to go ahead and fill up the agent's memory with dummy variables, dummy values. Uh, they don't really matter. Uh, we're just going to go ahead and load it up with dummy values and then call the agent's learn function so we can load our models. And so we can do a random action, doesn't really matter. Get our new state, reward done and info from our environment. And then remember that. And very important, you want to increment number of steps. Once you've done that, call the learn function and load your models and set evaluate <laughs> value eight to true. And if we're not going to be loading our checkpoint, we'll just say evaluate equals false. I guess we could just use load checkpoint in place of evaluate or call it evaluate, but whatever, I've used two separate variables, sue me. So for I in range and games, we wanna go ahead and reset our environment at the top of every episode. Reset the terminal flag and the score to zero. While the episode is not done, the agent can choose an action based on the observation and the evaluate flag. Get the new state reward uh, done and info from the environment. Increment our score and store that transition. Uh, if we're not loading a checkpoint, then we want to learn. And the reason I put in that uh, conditional statement is because if you're evaluating the performance of the agent, you probably don't want to disturb its parameters. You want to just go ahead and see how it performs as of the last time you saved it rather than trying to get it to learn a little bit more. Feel free to change that. And very importantly, we want to set the current state of the environment to the new state after the uh, agent took its action. So then we want to, um, at the end of every episode, we want to append the score and calculate the average to get an idea of whether or not our agent is learning. If the average score is 
better than the best known score, then set the best score to that average score. And again, if we aren't loading a checkpoint, go ahead and save your models. And at the end of every episode, we want to print some basic debug information. Episode I, score. And at the end of all the episodes, we want to print our, or plot our learning curve. So our x-axis, number of games, Okay, that is it for our main loop. Let's go ahead and test it out to make sure I made a sufficient number of typos. But as I said, the first thing we want to do is make dir temp. Uh, okay, I already have that. Make dir temp slash gdpg. I didn't have that. And make dir plots. I think that already exists. Okay, now we can go ahead and run the main file and see what I messed up. Okay, so, oh, yeah, of course, our critic network. Um, does not get a number of actions. That's something I changed on the fly. So let's fix that here as well. And we can go ahead and put this back up here. I think that is right. Let's try it again. Agent has no, oh, it's because it's target actor dot weights, not target actor underscore weights. That is in line 39. So right here that I do Nope, the target critic was correct. Okay. It has no attribute min size. Okay, oh, it's <laughs> min action. Uh, that's in line 73. Yeah, it's min action and max action. course all right that's in main line 41 see this is why I have the cheat sheet because even even with the cheat sheet I make a number of typos so you can imagine what it's like if I were to try to do it on camera that is in line 41 uh, if not load checkpoint there we go Good grief, call takes three positional arguments, but four were given. Oh, that's because I have my parentheses in the wrong place. Okay, that is in line 92. So the uh, state's target action, so the parentheses goes here. Yeah, that's right. My goodness, concat missing one required positional argument. Oh, because I have the, <laughs> because I have an extra parenthesis. Okay, so this is bad even for me. Line 23. So then we need a second parenthesis there. Critic trainable underscore variables. Once again, that is a trainable dot variables. That is in line 98. I thought I looked for that. Oh, no, I didn't. Critic dot trainable variables. And I did the same thing here. All right.
What, I just fixed that, did I not? Line 100. Didn't I just fix that? No, I did not just fix that. Brilliant, okay. Actor dot critic dot, okay. This is what happens when you don't do this for a month. Uh, making YouTube videos is a perishable skill. Okay, perfect. Now it is actually working. I've got gotten through all of those typos and it has started to run. So I'm gonna let this go ahead and finish up and we're gonna see how it does. All right, so it has finished running and you can see that at the end, it kind of tapered off a little bit in performance. If we scroll up, you can see that about halfway through, it was achieving record performance with pretty much every single simulation. Uh, that isn't entirely atypical with actor critic type methods. So oftentimes what will happen is the agent will achieve some reasonable performance and then kind of start to taper off because the, as I said, the actor network is relatively sensitive to changes in its parameters. In this case, it didn't fall off a cliff like I've seen with things like actor critic or policy gradient methods, but it is still nonetheless sensitive to changes in its weights and uh, is prone to deteriorations of performance late in the uh, number of simulations. If you take a look at the learning curve, you can see pretty clearly that it has an overall upward trend over time. So it is in fact learning. Our technique is working. It's doing its job, but it's not, you know, it's nothing, at least for this environment, it's not the greatest thing since sliced bread. We could do a little bit more tuning to get it even better. Uh, but for now, I think this is sufficient to A, demonstrate that it works and to B, have a solid tutorial on how to implement deep determined deterministic policy gradients. Once again, shameless plug, if you want to know how to go from paper to code, I show you how in my two Udemy courses on deep reinforcement learning, where we go through uh, several papers per course, one on deep Q learning, one on actor critic methods, and implement all these algorithms from scratch. I show you how to implement pretty much everything from the papers minus some superf superfluous features. Uh, either way, if you made it this far, please leave a like, a subscribe, drop a comment down below, and I'll see you in the next video. Welcome to a crash course in twin delayed deep deterministic policy gradients or TD3 for short. This is a very brief lecture that's going to cover the fundamental concepts and implementation notes for our coding tutorial which will follow this lecture. If you want the full details of how this algorithm works, I highly recommend you read the paper titled Addressing Function Approximation Error in Actor Critic Methods. It's very well written, very technical, very detailed, uh, and it covers significantly more detail and depth than I will do here. I'm just going to give you broad strokes and some idea of what we're going to be doing in our coding tutorial. And we're going to be using uh, TensorFlow 2, by the way, for our coding tutorial. So make sure you have that installed. So. TD3 exists to deal with a fairly straightforward issue. How do we deal with overestimation bias and continuous action space actor critic methods? If you're not familiar with overestimation bias, it is a tendency of agents to incorrectly estimate the value of a state on the high end. So it says this state is worth more than it actually is. And this is a problem because the agent will attempt to access that state in the future uh, which leads to a suboptimal policy because there are other more profitable states out there. So this is a pretty big problem, uh, particularly when you're trying to approximate the agent's policy as we are in actor critic methods. But it's not clear where this would even come from. In Q-learning, we get biased because we take a max over our actions in our update rule for the, either the table or our deep neural network. So there is some maximization or overestimation built in right from the beginning, and that's pretty easy to see. But there is no max in our update rule for actor critic methods, so what gives? Where could this overestimation bias come from? Well, on a somewhat theoretical level, I kind of argue, they don't do this in the paper, but the way I think of it is that we have stochastic gradient ascent where we're attempting to maximize the product of our uh, probabilities, our policy, and the rewards or um, returns the agent receives over time. So there is some implicit uh, drive to maximize uh, score over time. And so when you get natural variation in your rewards or in the trajectory through the state space, you can end up with some incorrect estimations of the values of states because of natural, you know, high variance, which is typical for deep reinforcement learning problems.
However, more fundamentally, overestimation comes from approximation errors. Now, this isn't something they prove in the paper because this is a result that dates all the way back to the early 1990s when people were just starting to talk about Q learning. And so it's been known for a while, but the basic idea is that when you attempt to use uh, some mathematical apparatus to estimate a function in a high dimensional space you get approximation errors and that results in overestimation. Now what is our source of overestimation or approximation error? In this case it's going to be a deep neural network. Neural networks are of course universal function approximators mostly. There are obvious exceptions, you know, discontinuous functions they can choke on, the function has to be differentiable and all that good stuff. But for all the stuff we deal with uh, neural networks are going to be a universal function approximator and so that leads to a source of error. Now uh, this is inherent to any approximation method, either tiling, uh, like uh, binning, anything like that. So it's not um, that neural networks are bad, it's just whenever you have a function approximation, you're going to have some error, okay? Because you don't have an infinite amount of time to collect an infinite number of samples to get infinite precision. You're always going to have to lop off your estimate at some point where there are more decimal points waiting for you should you be able to collect more data. Worse yet, actor critic methods are bootstrapped. What this means is that we're going to be using our initial estimates to perform updates to later estimates. And so you have some errors in your early estimates that propagate to your later estimates over time. So you get an accumulation of error over time. Now naturally, there are other ways of dealing with this. And in fact, double Q learning uses a rather ingenious solution. They use, in that algorithm, uh, two different Q networks and you alternate their use in the update rule. And so you're never taking a max over uh, actions of the same network that you use to choose an action when you're trying to update the value of that action. And so it seems like it's a reasonable thing to try, so in particular that's what they do. Now I want to point something out that in double Q learning, uh, deep, double D, deep double Q learning, they use a not exactly analogous solution to the tabular case of double Q learning. They use something slightly different, which doesn't work in actor critic methods as they detail in the paper. They're going to use a more exact replica of the tabular versioning of double Q learning. And they're going to perform a slight modification where they're going to clip the uh, inputs of the actions to the Q networks uh, the double Q networks, which is going to tend to underestimate, and we're going to be taking a min, so uh, later on you'll see in the algorithm that we're going to feed some clipped actions to our Q networks and then take the minimum. So whatever the minimum uh, value is, we're going to take that, which tends to underestimate. Now you may say, Dr. Phil, isn't that a problem? Uh, not really, and the reason it's not a problem is because uh, if we underestimate actions, those actions become less attractive to the uh, agent and so it's not likely to take those actions again and so that kind of dampens that out over time. Uh, it's a natural feedback mechanism to deal with that issue. So that is rather nice and it's baked right into the algorithm. The other innovation is that they're going to delay policy updates to give the um, critic network time to converge. So the uh, policy network is a uh, very slowly changing function uh, whereas the um, Q network can change much more quickly. So you have two different time scales there, and that's where the delayed part comes from. Another innovation is we're going to use target networks for the actor and both critics. Since we're doing an analog of double Q learning, which uses two Q networks, it stands to reason we're going to have two critics, and we're going to have target networks for all the things. So we're going to have uh, an actor, a target actor, two critics, and two target critics. So a total of six deep neural networks. We're going to have all the neural networks in the world. The other thing we're going to need is a soft update to the target networks. So you have a couple of options for um, updating the weights of your target networks. One is you could do a stochastic gradient descent on those directly. Another option is to take the uh, parameters from your online networks that you're actively performing gradient descent on and copy those to the target networks directly. Or a third uh, option is to do some slowly varying interpose between the two. So you're going to update the uh, online networks every time step or every n time steps in the case of the policy. And then you're going to do some slowly changing update 
to those target networks. And that'll introduce an additional hyperparameter called tau to our agent, which you will see later. So this is an actor critic method, and we're gonna have actually uh, six distinct. I have a typo there, sorry, I can't count, despite having a PhD in physics. So we're gonna have an actor, two critics, a target actor, and then two target critics, as I said. The purpose of the critic is to be critical. It is to evaluate the values of state and action pairs. So it says, hey, in this particular state, we took some action. I think this was valuable or not and that will help to update the agent's estimate of the values of those pairs and to choose better actions for given states over time. The actor will decide what to do based on the current state. And uh, it's important to note here that our deep neural network is gonna output action values, which are continuous numbers, not discrete numbers, uh, not probabilities. Now that makes this a deterministic algorithm. That's where the uh, name of the algorithm comes in, twin delayed deep deterministic policy gradients. It's an extension of deep deterministic policy gradients. And so we have a bit of a problem there because we're dealing with approximation, right? We're approximating a Q function, we're approximating a policy, we're approximating all the things, and we never know exactly how accurate our approximations are. And so we never know if we are correctly evaluating states and action pairs. So we never know if, given some state, if this action is really the most beneficial action we could possibly take, or if there's some other more beneficial action out there waiting to be discovered. That is called the explore exploit dilemma. Uh, do we explore suboptimal actions or exploit what we think are the most beneficial actions? And the extent to which you engage in those two activities is the dilemma. And there are a number of solutions to that. Deep Q learning uses epsilon greedy action selection, where you just take random actions some fixed proportion of the time. But in this case, we're going to be adding noise to the output of our actor network when we decide what actions to take. The update rule for actor looks a little bit scary, uh, but it's actually not. So this is the update rule from the paper. J is going to be our loss function for our actor. It's a function of phi, the parameters of the policy network. And you want to take the gradient of the cost function with respect to the parameters of the policy network. Uh, and it's given by 1 over m times the sun, the sum, or a mean, an average. So our loss function is going to be a mean. And it's going to be the product in this particular equation of the gradient of the first critic network with respect to the actions chosen by the policy network multiplied by the gradient of the policy network with respect to its parameters. Now, this looks intimidating, but it's actually not. This is the application of the chain rule to the loss function. So they have taken the gradient of the loss function with respect to phi, uh, but the loss function is proportional to the output of the first critic network. Of course, the first critic deep neural network has its own set of, of uh, neural network parameters. It doesn't have an explicit dependence on the neural network parameters of the policy network. So it's very difficult to take a gradient, right, of something that doesn't depend on something else. So the um, dependence is implicit. It comes from the fact that those actions are chosen according to the output of our policy network. And so you have to apply the chain rule. In reality, all we're going to do is the following. We're going to randomly sample states from our memory. We're going to use our actor network to determine actions for those states. So we're not going to be using the actions from our memory. We're going to figure out what actions the agent thinks we should take now. We're going to plug those actions into our critic and get some value, specifically the first critic, never the second, only the first. That's just by design. And then we're going to take the gradient with respect to the actor network parameters. Now, we don't have to calculate that gradient. TensorFlow is going to do it for us. We just have to do the first three things where we sample states, uh, use the actor to determine actions for those states, and plug those into our critic along with the states to get some value, and then take the gradient with respect to the actor network parameters. Now, keep in mind that this update isn't performed every time step, it's performed every other time step. Uh, how often you perform it is a hyperparameter of the algorithm, but it is not every single time step. Now, nominally, the update rule for the critic is a little more straightforward. So again, you're going to sample a batch of transitions from your memory. You're going to put the new states that the agent received, uh, observed after taking some action through the target actor network. 
That's that A tilde parameter there. And then you're gonna add in some clipped noise. It's just gonna be a normally distributed noise with mean zero and some standard deviation, something like 0 0.2. And we're gonna clip it in the range of minus 0 0.5 to positive 0 0.5. So that's where the clipping comes in for our double Q learning. Uh, and the actual double Q part comes in when we calculate our targets Y. So we're gonna take the reward that we sample from our buffer and add it to the product of the gamma, which is the discount factor, 0 0.99 or so. And we're gonna take the minimum of the output of the two uh, target critic networks. So we'll say we're gonna feed the new states through the new states and those clipped actions through both target critic networks, and then we're gonna see which one is the minimum and take that for our target value. And then we're gonna input that target value uh, into our loss function. Again, you have a one over n multiplied by sum, uh, multiplied by something squared, that is a mean squared error, and it's the mean squared error between that target y and the output of both of our critic networks. So our loss is gonna have two different components. It's gonna have a loss for critic one, where you have Q sub theta sub one, uh, and then it'll have a loss for Q sub theta sub two. So we have two losses, and in TensorFlow 2, when we do our gradient tape, we're gonna have to pass in the persistent equals true flag to our uh, function call so that it keeps track of network parameters between gradient ascent steps. And so these, the rest of this verbiage is just kind of the uh, verbal description of what we want to do. It's going to be much easier once you see it written in code. I assure you it's not that difficult. Next, we have to handle the question of target network updates. So at the very beginning, uh, in our constructor for our agent class, we're going to go ahead and initialize actor, two critic networks, and then, two tar uh, and then a target actor and two target critic networks. And when we first start out, we want to initialize those target networks with the exact values of the um, online networks. And so we're going to have a special case in our target network update function that handles uh, the very beginning of the program. Every other time step, we're going to use the following uh, expression to update the weights. So on the left side, you have theta and phi prime, where the i on the theta de uh, denotes either critic one or two. Phi is the parameter for our critic network, uh, excuse me, policy network and the thetas are the parameters for our critic networks. And so you're going to multiply tau, some small number, 0 0.005 in this case, by the values of the current uh, online network and add in 1 minus tau times the old values of the, on, uh, the critic network. So it'll be a small number multiplied by the current values of your online networks plus something that's almost one multiplied by the old values of your target networks. So it's going to be a slowly changing update to our target networks. Other thing to note is that we're only going to be performing this update when we update the actor network. So it's not every time step. In this case, it'll be every other time step. Very, very important. So for this program, we're going to need a number of data structures. We're going to need a class for our replay buffer, the agent's memory. Now, I like to use NumPy arrays. It is not the best way or the only way to do it. It's just my preferred way. So uh, follow along with me in the tutorial, do it that way. And then when you play around with the code later to understand it better, go ahead and rewrite the replay buffer to something that makes more sense to you. That's a great way to get started with modifying the program is with the replay buffer. Next, we're gonna have classes for our actor network and our critic network. And those are of course written in TensorFlow 2. We'll have another class for our agent, and that is really going to tie everything together. It's going to have a memory that keeps track of transitions. It's going to have an actor, two critics, target networks for each of those, a function to choose an action based on the current state, a function to learn that performs the update rules we just went over, an interface function with its memory uh, that I call remember just to store transitions in the agent's memory, as well as functionality to save models and perform uh, target network updates, which I forgot to write here. Finally, we're going to need a main loop to train and evaluate our algorithm. So we're going to be using the OpenAI Gym and the Bipedal Walker in particular because this is a kind of difficult environment for other uh, algorithms. Uh, it's a continuous uh, 
action space with a pretty large state space. I think it has 24 different components in the state space, if I'm not mistaken. Some are relatively large number. So it's a bit difficult for agents to learn. And in fact, it's going to take uh, my computer around six or seven hours to complete the evaluation. I'm filming this after I do the code. So it'll take a while to run. Uh, so if it takes forever on your computer, uh, don't don't panic. That's normal, quite normal. So all that out of the way, let's go ahead and get started in the coding portion of this tutorial. All right, so we begin as usual with our imports. We will need NumPy, the base TensorFlow package. We will need uh, TensorFlow.Keras. We will need layers um, from, yeah, import dense. That is for constructing our deep neural networks. And we will need our atom optimizer for the gradient descent. And we will need OS for file joining operations for model checkpointing. Let's start with our replay buffer class. Now this should be very familiar to you if you're deep, used to deep Q learning. We'll need a max size, input shape, and number of actions as input to our constructor. Now remember we're dealing with continuous action spaces, so this number of actions is really a number of components to our continuous action. I just name it that for consistency with my deep Q learning code. So we will save the appropriate member variables. We use a memory counter instantiated at zero because our memory is finite. We'll need our state memory which we'll initialize as zeros in the shape mem size and star input shape. The star idiom just unpacks a uh, an array, in this case, uh, whatever the shape of our input uh, dimensionality is from our environment. We'll of course need a new state memory, and that's the same shape. That keeps track of the new states that we are going to see. An action memory, And remember, of course, again, number of actions is number of components to our action. The reward memory in the shape of memory size and a terminal memory. We're going to use uh, NumPy, NumPy, NumPy bool as our data type. That'll keep track of our terminal flags, the reason being that the value of the terminal state is always zero, and so we keep track of the uh, done flags from our environment to accommodate that. So let's store a transition. That takes the state observed, action taken, reward received, new state observed, and terminal flag received as input. We wanna know what the first available memory position is and that's um, memory counter modulus mem size. That is a property that it will overwrite earlier memories with uh, newer memories as soon as the memory fills up. And then go ahead and save our variables. We'll state underscore terminal memory. And that's all of them, I believe. And very important, we want to increment our memory counter by one. Next, we have to handle the function to sample our buffer. And that'll just take a batch size as input. We wanna know what the uh, position of our maximum filled memory is. And that's given by this uh, minimum of mem counter and mem size because we don't want to sample zeros. We initialize our memory with zeros, so if we just sample the entire buffer, then we're probably going to end up sampling zeros until we fill up that buffer, which is totally useless. So then the batch is going to be a random choice from zero to max mem in shape batch size. Then go ahead and dereference our variables.
and Duns. All right, that wraps up our replay uh, memory. That's very, very simple. Uh, probably the most straightforward class in the entire project. Next, we're gonna move on to our uh, critic network. And that will derive from Keras.model, so we get access to all of the properties of that particular base class. That'll help with using the gradient tape for learning later on. <clears throat> We're going to take some uh, inputs for the number of uh, dimensions for the first and second fully connected layers, number of actions, again, number of components, a name for the purpose of model checkpointing, and a checkpoint directory. We will have to do <clears throat> a make directory on that before you begin, otherwise you will get an error and it will not work. Let's call our super constructor and start saving stuff. Do I need to do that? Yeah, why not? So the purpose of the name is the fact that um, we're going to be saving target networks as well as regular networks. And there are going to be two critics. So we want to be able to keep all of those straight when we handle model checkpointing. So we'll save our model name, checkpoint directory, and the checkpoint file. And I like to append the algorithm name to the uh, checkpoint file so that if I do everything in one working directory when I'm experimenting, uh, all the names uh, tell me exactly which um, file correspond to which algorithm. You don't have to do that, it's just my own personal convention. So for our deep neural network, <clears throat> we'll start with a, a dense layer with a ReLU activation. Second dense layer with ReLU activation and an output that will be single valued with no activation. Um, now keep in mind one interesting thing about uh, TensorFlow 2 is that we don't have to specify the number of input dimensions. It infers it from the inputs. That's a pretty nice feature. So now we define our feed forward. In this case we call it call. That will allow us to use the name of an object as a function call basically. We need a state and action as input. We'll have a Q1 action value, and we will want to concatenate our state and action along the first axis, and we will feed that through FC2 Q1 action value, and then pass it through the final layer, action value, and return. Now keep in mind that the critic evaluates the value of both the action and state, so that's why we have to concatenate the two values. That is it for our critic network. Very, very straightforward. Next, we're gonna handle our actor network. And that again derives from Keras.model, just the same as the critic network. Our initializer takes uh, dimensionality as input again as well number of actions and you know what did I I'm sorry I'm checking something here no I did not for a second there I thought I passed in uh, input shape to the critic network that would have been totally unnecessary checkpoint directory equals temp td3 we want all of the models to live in the same directory very very helpful and then we can go ahead and start saving stuff. And I'm looking at this and as I look at the what I'm doing here, so I like to modify stuff on the fly. 
I don't think I actually need this and actions here. So let's go ahead and delete that just for the sake of cleanliness. We will need it in the actor, of course. Um, yeah, let's keep it nice and clean. The model name. Checkpoint directory. plus td3 and just for clarity that name will have stuff like target actor target critic actor or critic so we can keep all of those particular networks uh straight and of course the two critics will be critic one or critic two because we have very interesting naming conventions so now we'll have our deep neural network again a uh simple dense layer with ReLU activations for the first two layers, and then mu for our output. And that will take uh, an actions as our output dimensionality with a tan hyperbolic activation. The tan hyperbolic is bound between minus one and plus one. If you wanna take into account boundaries of actions that are beyond plus or minus one, you can multiply this output by the uh, maximum bounds for your environment. So some environments will have a max action of plus or minus two, which of course plus or minus one is oftentimes less than you know two. So uh, you have to take that into account depending on the environment. So again, we need a call function to handle the feed forward. So we'll pass our state through the first fully connected layer, second fully connected layer, and pass that through the final layer and return it. So that is it for our actor network. Next, we need an agent class to tie everything together and to handle all of the really interesting functionality. So our agent doesn't derive from anything, but our super constructor, excuse me, our constructor is going to take a whole slew of inputs. So we need a couple different learning rates. Reason being, you want to accommodate the capacity for different learning rates for your actor and critic network. Sometimes they learn best with different learning rates. Uh, input dims, you'll need that for your memory. Tau for your uh, soft update rule. Your environment for a number of important variables from the environment. Default gamma of 0 0.99. The update update date actor interval will default it to every other iteration a warm-up of a thousand steps uh, just a default value for n actions max size of a million transitions um, layer one size 400 layer two size that's our FC one and two dims respectively a batch size default of 300 and a noise of 0.1. Let's go ahead and start saving stuff. Since we will be adding a noise, we're gonna have to perform clamping on our actions to make sure that the actions, uh, the action plus the noise don't fall outside the allowable bounds of the environment or below. We'll need our memory. That's a replay buffer. Then we need batch size. We need a learn step counter. Uh, we'll need that because we're doing the delayed part of uh, TD3. We're gonna delay the updates of the actor network uh, every to every two different iterations of the update of the critic network to give the critic network time to converge. Then we have, um, you know, I'm looking at my cheat sheet here. Oh, a time step. Why do I have a time step? Excuse me one moment. No, I believe the time step is for the uh, warm up procedure. We shall double check that later. If not, I'll come back and delete it in the GitHub. And we don't want to forget number of actions. Sorry, I write this code, you know, sometimes well in advance of doing the video uh, because I get distracted by other stuff. Uh, and so when I come back to it, I don't always know what I was thinking. That is a benefit of comments, which I don't really do for this stuff. Sue me, I probably should. We do need our update 
actor iteration and that is update actor interval excuse me let me close my door my toddler is rampaging and next we can go ahead and start defining our actors and critics and so the name will just be actor because we are quite creative to maintain compliance with the pep8 style god let's go ahead and delete a couple spaces critic one is a critic network your one size layer two size and we don't need um, number of actions there because I deleted it so its name will be critic one likewise for critic two And again, the purpose of this is to handle the double Q learning update rule. Next, we will need a target actor. Layer two size. Let me go ahead and delete the spaces. Oh, you know what? Silly style guides. And finally, a name of target actor. Then we'll need target critic one. With a very original name of target critic one. Similarly, critic net target critic two. And that is it for our networks. Next, we have to compile them because this is a TensorFlow 2. And that is where our learning rates come into play. So we will use our Atom Optimizer with the learning rate defined by alpha for our critic. Our loss would just be a mean. And our critic one. Learning rate of beta a loss of mean squared error and critic two have to do the same thing mean rate equals beta do I need uh, yes I do I do need parentheses there mean squared error and then we will handle our target networks nest target networks nest next that is a tongue twister so we have to compile the target networks just by convention with tensorflow 2 we're not going to be performing any stochastic gradient descent or atom uh, in this case on those particular networks we're going to be doing the um, soft network updates but we still have to compile them nevertheless that is just by convention Rate of alpha loss equals mean. Target critic one. Okay, so that is all of our networks. Self.noise, we'll keep track of as well. Update network parameters with the default value of tau equals one. I do that because on the first step of the update, we have to set the values of our target networks equal to the starting values of the online networks. And so we pass in a value of tau equals one to perform an exact update or a hard update instead of a soft update.
We'll handle that function toward the end. For now, I want to get to the choose action, remember, and learn functionality, because that's where all the really interesting stuff is. <clears throat> so let's go ahead and choose an action based upon an observation of the current state of the environment as input. So if our time step is less than our warm-up period, uh, yeah, that's why we need the time step to handle um, the warm-up, as I suspected. Glad I didn't delete that. Uh, we're going to select an action at random with uh, just a normal distribution with a scale defined by uh, our noise parameter in the shape of number of actions, comma, so we get a batch there. Uh, in, uh, sorry, an array of, of scalars. Otherwise, we want to go ahead and convert our state to a tensor and add on a batch dimension. That's just uh, the way that the inputs are expected to be fed into the deep neural network. We have to add that batch dimensionality. And I have TF float 32 here. It must be due to some sort of uh, precision thing that makes TensorFlow happy. So then we want to pass our state through our actor network and receive our mu. And we're doing that because it returns batch size of one, want scalar. Uh, then we'll say mu prime, which is where we handle the noise, equals mu plus mp random uh, normal, scale equals self dot noise, and um, mu prime is tf clip by value because again that noise could take us outside the bounds of our environment so we'll clamp mu prime between min action and max action increase our time step by one very important and we want to return mu prime okay that's it for our choose action now let's handle the simple interface function to remember a transition so remember state action reward new state done and we'll say memory dot store transition state action reward new state done and that's just because um, we have to interface with the memory in some way you don't want to have the uh, agent class calling uh, you don't want to have the agent class interacting with private variables from your memory that would be poor software design so next we handle the most interesting function in the whole program which is the learn function and the very first thing we want to do is say hey if we haven't um, filled up at least batch size of memory we probably don't want to be learning so we'll say self.memory.mem counter plus and batch size now uh, if it's not if it's not greater than the batch size or equal to go ahead and return. Now since we're doing a warm up that won't be the case because the batch size is just a few hundred, the warm up is a thousand. So by the time uh, we get through the warm up, then we're already well into um, <clears throat> filling up the batch size of memories. But if you decided not to do a warm up, then that would be important. So we'll start by sampling our memory. Self memory sample buffer pass in our batch size. And then we want to convert all of those to TensorFlow tensors. And I have to be very pedantic with data types here. Uh, I think there could be issues if you do not. As I recall, I think it barks at you about data types because it expects certain types of floating point variables uh, in some places and other types elsewhere. And we don't have to convert the duns to a tensor because we're not sticking that in a deep neural network. We're just using that as a multiplicative factor so we can leave it as a NumPy array. Now we're gonna handle our um, update to the critic network because we do that every time step and then we'll handle the update to our actor network. So we'll say um, with TF gradient tape you know, I have persistent equals true. Oh, because I have two different networks. Yeah, so you need two different 
if you're using two different um, updates for one group, excuse me, if you're using two different apply gradients for a single tape, then you need to uh, pass in the persistent equals true variable uh, parameter, excuse me, or argument. <laughs> uh, otherwise, you don't need that persistent equals true. You just have, say, a single network that you're performing an update on. So we want the actions according to our target actor uh, for the new states. And then we're gonna go ahead and uh, add on a noise parameter to that, that we're going to clip between the range of minus 0.5 and positive 0.5. So clip by value, np random normal, 0 0.2 minus 0 0.5. 0.5 and then we're going to go ahead and clip that again because again the addition of that noise could take the action outside of the bounds of our environment and then we're Free to go ahead and start calculating our critic values. So Q1 underscore the critic value according to the first target critic is the feed forward of the new states and target actions through the first target critic. Q2 underscore is very similar. It's just the evaluation of the new states and target actions according to the second critic. Now again, we're gonna to have to go ahead and squeeze that output. And the reason is, is that um, our shape is batch size by one, want to collapse to batch size. <clears throat> and we have to do that for Q2 as well, excuse me, Q2 underscore. And then we're going to need the uh, the value of the states and actions the agent actually took according to the uh, regular critic uh, one excuse me one and two networks. So we'll call those Q1, and we'll just go ahead and squeeze those right away. Critic one states actions squeezed along the first dimension. Critic two states actions one and then we're going to say that our critic value for the new states is the minimum of q1 underscore q2 underscore and then we're going to need our target value the y from our paper rewards plus gamma times critic value times one minus duns that will set the value of the second term here gamma times critic value uh, there should be an underscore there, sorry, uh, to zero everywhere the done flag is true. And then we have our losses. So critic one loss, keras losses dot mean squared error between the target and Q1. Mean squared error target and Q2. So that is it for the calculation of the critic losses. Now we have to handle the calculation of the gradients. Now we don't have to do anything special for that. The TensorFlow package handles that for us. So tape.gradient, the gradient um, critic one loss with respect to the critic one trainable variables. Uh, so that should be dot, not an underscore. I make that mistake frequently. Critic one, critic underscore one, dot trainable variables yeah that is right and then we need the critic 2 gradient critic 2 loss self dot critic 2 trainable variables same deal then we need to go ahead and apply those gradients so calling our optimizer dot apply gra gradients <laughs> function and that expects a zip as input we're going to zip the critic one gradient and the self critic one trainable variables 
Same thing for Critic 2. Optimize Er. To gradient okay and then we want to increment our learn step counter because that gets incremented every time we update our critic networks and then we have to address the question of is it time to update our actor network so we'll say if that learn step counter modulus self.update actor interval iter, sorry, is not equal to zero, then return. So if it's not uh, every uh, n steps, then go ahead and return. And if we haven't returned, then we're gonna go ahead and calculate the loss for our actor network. So with TF gradient tape as tape, and here since we're just dealing with one loss, we don't have to call the persistent equals true. Uh, we don't have to pass in the persistent equals true argument. So let's see, our new actions are the actions chosen by the current parameters of our actor network for the current set of states. This states the agent saw along the way. The critic one value is self.critic one of those states and new actions. And then our actor loss it was negative TF math reduce mean critic one value. And this may look a little strange to you, but this is how we're gonna handle the uh, gradient of the output of one network with respect to the parameters of a network. It's kind of like how you apply the chain rule to the, uh, to the loss of the output of the critic network with respect to the um, parameters of your target actor, your actor network, sorry. I hope that makes sense. So then we do the same thing where we calculate our gradient, tape.gradient, uh, sorry, tape.gradient, did I call? Let me make sure I didn't make a mistake. I did make a mistake up here, sorry. So this should be tape.gradient, not TF. That is one less error to worry about when we get to running the program. Sorry about that. So tape.gradient, actor loss, actor trainable variables. I'm gonna step our optimizer by applying our gradients. Again, that takes a zip as input. Uh, actor gradient self.actor trainable variables okay so then finally at the end of the learning function we want to update our network parameters okay so that really handles all of the learning algorithm for our agent all that's left now is to update our network parameters and then handle the model saving so just a few functions left and then we can go write our main loop and see how it does so network parameters um, so we're going to pass in a default value of tau for none remember that at the top of our uh, rather the end of our initializer we pass in uh, tau equals one to handle a hard update uh, every other time we're going to pass in a none so we'll say if tau is none then tau equals self dot tau so every time other than the first time we call this we're going to use the stored value for tau so weights equal an empty list targets equal self dot target actor dot weights for i weight in enumerate self actor weights weights dot append uh, weight times tau plus targets sub i times one minus tau there we go and then self dot target actor dot set weights and I am going to uh, yank this and paste and paste 
again and then say target critic one self dot critic one weights um, set weights sorry I forgot to set the actual value of the weights how sloppy of me and then say self dot target critic one set weights weights and then we have target critic two enumerate critic two weights weights dot append and then self dot target critic two dot set weights and that handles our update rule for our two networks. Sorry, my numlock key is off there. Okay, so if it isn't clear what's going on here, we are iterating over the weights of our actor and critic one, critic two networks. Then we're doing the calculation for the soft update rule, saving that in a temporary list and uploading that list to the target actor or target critic one or critic two networks. Now we can handle the uh, save model functionality. This is the easiest part of the whole project. So print saving models. Just a little debug statement to let us know something is going on. Save weights. Self.actor.checkpoint file. Dot critic one checkpoint file. Checkpoint file, and then we have our target networks as well. Good grief. Then we do the inverse operation of loading our models. Self.actor load weights from the actor at checkpoint file. Then we have critic one load weights. Self.critic one dot checkpoint file uh, and then we have our target networks I should have chosen shorter variable names to save my wrists a little bit of work here but hindsight is always 2020 I guess Target critic one checkpoint file okay so that is it for the main code for our TD3 algorithm now we get to handle the main loop so let's go ahead and code that up Uh, of course, before we can, I have an invalid syntax right here at the very beginning. Um, tensorflow.keras.layers. Oh, uh, sorry, that's because it's a from. Import dense. I'll have to notate that in the video. And I have another issue here. Uh, def store transition. Where is it unhappy? I am missing a comma, of course. And I have another issue, OS path join name equals. 
Yeah, my wrists are non-functional today. Self dot target actor dot set weights. Oh. Uh why did that happen? Interesting. Did I type those at the end and have a stroke or something? Don't remember it. Very strange. Okay, unexpected. And a file. Let's delete there. Same. Uh, am I forgetting a parenthesis somewhere? I am. Because I have... Right there. All right, finally. Good grief. That's a whole lot of typos. Now, some people suggest that I upgrade my Vim uh, to actually catch that stuff on the fly, and you're absolutely right. I'm going to do that uh, when I finally force myself to do it. Let's go ahead, in the meantime, and write our main loop. So we want to import Jim numpy. Uh, we'll need our agent, and we'll need our utility file uh, plot learning curve. You can do a git clone on my GitHub to get that. It's just a matplotlib pi plot with some labeled axes uh, where we're taking an average of the previous 100 games running. Um, I don't include that in all my videos. I just kind of t uh, reference my GitHub. You can just do a plot. If you wish, name equals main, gym.make. We're going to be doing the bipedal walker v2. And we're going to call our agent constructor alpha 0.01, a beta of 0.001. Our input dimensions will be determined by our environment so we don't have to hard code anything tau of 0 0.005 pass in our environment batch size I have a hundred here equals 400 300 and an actions determined again by our uh, environment we'll let this bad boy play a thousand games and we'll call our file name plots plus walker underscore. Now keep in mind, you have to do a make dir plots and a make dir temp slash td3 to uh, correctly execute the code uh, because it'll expect that those directories exist. Pass in number of games uh, as a variable for your file name. That way, if you run it over and over again with different numbers of games, it won't overwrite the same plot. You can also include things like learning rates as part of your variable name for your uh, file names. I recommend doing that. I'm just not doing it here. So we need to keep track of our best score. It's the minimum score of our environment. And the reason is we want to save our best models. Keep track of your score history. If you want to load models, now is the appropriate time to do that. Actually, you know what? Uh, we may need, there may be an issue where uh, we have to actually instantiate our network with some variables to load the models. Hmm. Uh, open up an issue on my GitHub if that's the case, and I will write the correct code. I won't bother with the video. I'll leave that as an exercise for the viewer. But if it turns out to be a problem, raise an issue and... I can fix that. Not a huge deal. Let's go ahead and play our games. Start by resetting the environment at the top of every episode. Reset the done flag and zero. And let's play our episode while not done. Action equals agent dot choose action based on the observation. Let's take that action get the new state reward done and debug info from our environment uh, call our learn function uh, keep track of our score and set the current state to the new state very important if you don't do that nothing is going to go well for you let's append our score at the bottom of every episode and calculate our average
minus 100 onward. If our average score is greater than our best score, then set the best score to that average and save our models. And then we want to print some debug information. Episode I score 1F average uh, score average score and at the end of all the games let's go ahead and handle our plotting our x-axis is just the number of games and call plot learning curve all right so moment of truth let's go ahead and see where I have my invalid syntax. I forgot an addition sign there. Very simple. All right, let's try it. Uh, you know what? I'm running it over in this other terminal. And okay, so it saves models. It is learning. That is good to know. Let's do a make dir temp slash td3. Uh, I should already have plots. Python main td3.py moment of truth okay so it says actor network object has no attribute checkpoint file i didn't oh it's checkpoint directory so that is in uh td3 tf2 that is in line 70 so uh that is here Okay, try it again. Got an unexpected argument name. That is in... Oh, that's because... <laughs> uh, okay, that is in line 48. That is super trivial. It's not name equals, it's name plus. Did I do that uh, down here as well? No, I did not. I'm not looking forward to editing this. This is gonna be a lot of work. Okay, so it saves models right off the bat and starts running. Okay, so I'm gonna let this run for a while uh, and then we're gonna see how it does. Okay, so I did something very stupid, and uh, I let it run and noticed it wasn't actually learning, and so that's a problem. And the reason it's not learning is because I forgot to store the transition. So we have to say agent, remember, observation, action, reward, observation, underscore, and done. Okay, and then I gotta get rid of the uh, print statements I stuck in here uh, for debug purposes uh, because I'm a noob and use debug statements. Okay. Now let's do python main td3.py and now it should work without any funky print statements. Okay. Now I'm going to take off for a little bit and see what's going on. And uh, the reason I noticed this wasn't learning is because it was executing much too quickly. Uh, it blasted through 350 games in just about a minute, which tells me it's not doing anything useful in the GPU. So uh, I'm going to let this run. That'll probably take an hour or two, and then I'm going to come back and see how it did, and we'll take a look at its performance. Now, here we are. It's the next morning. This took around six or seven hours to run, so I just waited until morning to film this. Uh, but in typical Phil style, the... Uh, file name for the, the function call for the plot uh, learning curve function has a typo in it. And so we don't have an actual plot from the performance of this particular run. However, I will show you a plot of a similar run where it achieved an approximately similar score. You can see that uh, it does indeed learn. It achieves a high score of around 285, 288, about 290 or so, depending on the run. You get some run to run variation. And 300 is the highest possible score you can get 
for this environment. Uh, so I would consider this pretty much strong evidence of learning. It's not a world-class result, but that's not what we were aiming for anyway. We just wanted to understand the gist of the algorithm and implement it correctly and demonstrate that we do in fact understand how it works. Mission accomplished. You can pat yourself on the back for that. I'll also show you some footage of the uh, walker kind of stumbling along so you can see how it looks once it's fully trained. Uh, you can see it has kind of a funny gait, but it does in fact manage to learn to walk. That is pretty impressive, starting from just totally random actions, learning how to walk within just six or seven hours. If only humans were so competent. I hope that was helpful. Leave a comment down below with any questions, suggestions, anything you'd like to see next. Give a thumbs up, a subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you in the next video. Welcome to a crash course in proximal policy optimization. Before we begin, a quick shameless plug. My Udemy courses on deep reinforcement learning, specifically anti-critic methods and deep Q learning, are on sale right now. Learn how to turn papers into code. Link in the description below. So proximal policy optimization, or PPO for short, was created for a pretty simple reason. And that is that in actor critic methods, oftentimes we see that the performance can fall off a cliff. The agent will be doing really well for a little while and suddenly an update to the neural network will cause the agent to simply lose uh, its, its understanding of how to play the game. And so performance tanks and never really recovers. Now, this happens because actor critic methods are incredibly sensitive to perturbations. The reason being that small changes in the uh, underlying parameters to our deep neural network, the weights, for instance, can cause large jumps in policy space. And so you can go from a region of policy space where performance is good to a region of policy space where performance is bad just by a small tweak to the underlying parameters of your deep neural network. PPO addresses this by limiting the updates to the policy network. It has a number of mechanisms for doing this, uh, but the basic idea is that we're going to base the update at each step on the ratio of the new policy to the old. And we're going to constrain that ratio to be within a specific range to make sure we're not taking really huge steps in um, parameter space for our deep neural network. Of course, we also have to account for the goodness of state, in other words, the advantage, how valuable each state is, and the reason being, naturally, that we want the agent to select states that are highly profitable to it over time, so it wants to find the best possible states. Now, taking into account the advantage can cause the uh, the loss function to grow a little bit too large, and so we're going to be introducing a way of dealing with that by clipping the loss function and taking the lower bound with the minimum function. Something else we're going to be doing that's different than what you may be used to is that instead of keeping track of something like, say, a million transitions and then sampling a subset of those at random, we're going to be keeping a very small fixed length trajectory of memories. And we're going to be uh, doing multiple network updates per data sample using mini batch stochastic gradient descent. It's worth noting that you can also use multiple parallel actors on the CPU, something like what you would do in A3C, but we're not gonna deal with that in this particular tutorial. I'm just gonna show you how to do the GPU implementation. So let's talk about the mini batch gradient descent for a second. So we're gonna keep track of a list of memory indices from say zero to 19, and that's for the case of taking a look at 20 transitions. And let's say we want to take a batch of size 5. And so those batches could start at position 0, 5, 10, or 15. Uh, those are the only uh, possible positions for it to start such that you get all the memories, you don't get any overlap, and uh, that it all works out evenly. So what we're going to do is we're going to shuffle our memories and then take batch size chunks. So we'll start at position 0, go from 0 all the way up to 4, that is one batch, and then position f uh, 5 up to 9 is the next batch, and so on and so forth. It's relatively straightforward when you see it in code, but it's kind of difficult to explain as you're coding it. So just know that we're taking batch size chunks of shuffled memories for a mini batch stochastic gradient ascent. Other things we need to know is that we're going to be using two distinct networks for our actor and our critic instead of having a single network with shared inputs and multiple outputs. Now you certainly can use a shared input with multiple outputs, but it complicates the loss function a little bit, and I found that performance is generally adequate with two distinct networks for simple environments. 
So the critic will evaluate the states that the agent encounters, uh, and it gets the name critic because it literally criticizes the decisions that the actor makes based on which states it ends up in. So it says, hey, this particular state was valuable, we did good, or this state is stupid, we did bad, do better next time. Now this is in contrast to state and action pairs for something like, say, deep cue learning, but it's in line with what other actor critic methods use. And of course, the actor decides what to do based on its current state. So our network is going to output probabilities using a soft max activation, and we'll use that for a categorical distribution in PyTorch. So we'll have, in the case of the cart pull, we'll have a couple actions and some probabilities selecting each action, and then we will use the probabilities determined by our deep neural network to feed into a distribution that we can sample and use for the calculation of the log probabilities. More on that momentarily. It's also worth noting that exploration is going to be taken care of for us due to the fact that we're using a distribution. So it's probabilistic and is set up so that each element has some finite probability. So even if the uh, probability of one action goes arbitrarily close to one, the probability selecting the other action stays finite so that at least some of the time it's going to get some exploration. This is in contrast to something like, say, Epsilon Greedy Action Selection and Deep Q Learning, where you select off-optimal uh, off actions about 10% of the time. As I said earlier, our memory is going to be fixed to a length of capital T. In this case, we'll use 20 different steps. We're going to keep track of the states the agent sees, the actions it takes, rewards it receives, the terminal flags, the values of those states according to the critic network, and the log of the probability of selecting those actions. That will become important later in our update rule. As I said, we're going to shuffle those memories and sample a batch size of 5, and we're going to perform 4 epochs of updates on each batch. Now, these parameters are chosen specifically for this particular environment, and that's one of my criticisms of PPO, is that there are a number of parameters to play with hyperparameters. The memory length is one hyperparameter, the batch size and number of epochs, as well as learning rate, and another parameter we're going to see later, all play roles of hyperparameters in our model, and so there is a lot to tune here, but these parameters work really well for the... Um, cart pull environment, so you won't have to do any tweaking for that. Other thing to note is that this memory length, capital T, should be much less than the length of the episode. So in the case of the cart pull, the maximum episode length is 200 steps, and so 20 steps is significantly less than that, so I think it qualifies. You wouldn't want to use uh, something that encompassed more than one episode, for instance, uh, that would probably break the algorithm and result in poorer performance relative to using a capital T, much less than the episode length. So all this is relatively simple, but what isn't so simple is the update rule for our actor. So here's where all the math comes in. So we have this quantity loss CPI, this stands for conservative policy iteration, and it's given by the expectation value, which is just an average, of the product of the ratio of the policy under the current parameters to the policy under the old parameters multiplied by this a hat sub t. More on that in a second. And they just they, and they just abbreviate that ratio as r sub t. Now, if you're not familiar with deep reinforcement learning or reinforcement learning in general, the policy is a probability distribution. That is what our actor is attempting to model is a probability distribution, the policy. And this policy is a mapping between states and actions and probabilities. So given you're in state S sub T and you took action A sub T, what was the probability of selecting that action according to the distribution? And so in the denominator we have theta old. That is the um, probability of selecting action A sub T given state S sub T uh, under the old parameters of your deep neural network. So we're going to play 20 steps and then the agent is going to perform a learning update and it's going to do uh, mini batch stochastic gradient ascent and so after computing that first batch, the parameters of the deep neural network change, right? That's how the uh, batches work. You compute the loss with each batch and update your parameters. And so right after you've calculated that first batch of memories, the loss for that and updated your deep neural network, uh, the theta changes. And so the policy pi is going to change as well. And so we have to keep track of the parameters, uh, excuse me, of the, the probabilities of uh, of selecting each action at each time step in our memory.
And then on a learning function, we're going to pass those states through our actor network, get the probabilities, the probability distribution, and find out what the probability of selecting action A sub T is sampled from our memory according to the current values of the deep neural network. It'll be a little bit more clear in code. Uh, just know that we have to keep track of log probs as we go along, and then we're going to be recalculating them in the learning loop. One thing we also see is that it takes into account the advantage which is at a hat sub t. So the advantage is just a measure of the goodness of each state. We'll get to the calculation of that in a few minutes. Uh, but one thing to note is that this ratio, uh, pi sub theta over pi sub theta old, um, can have an arbitrary value, right? Because you could have, let's say, pi theta being 0.99, pi theta old 0 0.01, and so that's a pretty large number. And in particular, if you multiply it by an advantage that is like, say, 10, 20, whatever, then that can also still be a large number. And so we have to deal with that, right? Because the whole point of this is that we want to constrain the updates to our deep neural network to be some relatively small amount. And so the way you deal with that is by adding an additional hyperparameter, epsilon, that you use to clip that ratio. So what we're going to do is we're going to clip that ratio within the range 1 minus epsilon to plus 1 plus epsilon. So let's say from 0 0.8 to 1.2. So that ratio is going to be constrained to be close to 1. And you're going to multiply that by the advantage. And so that'll give you some number. And then you want to uh, take the minimum of that clipped number, the clipped ratio multiplied by the advantage, and the unclipped ratio multiplied by the advantage, take the minimum. And that is what we will use for the loss for our actor network. So this serves as a pessimistic lower bound to the loss. And they don't go into any real depth in the paper on the reasoning for this. Uh, but to my mind, and this could be wrong, you know, I am an idiot sometimes, but my understanding is smaller loss, smaller gradient, smaller update. That's the whole point of it. So let's talk about this advantage now. So this advantage... Um, has to be calculated at each time step, and it's given by this equation. Now, don't freak out. This is relatively straightforward. Uh, once again, it tells us the benefit of the new state over the old. Well, how do we know that? We know that because it's proportional to uh, or equal to the sum of the delta sub t, where the delta sub t is just the reward at a time step plus the difference in the estimated value of the new state and the current state. So it tells you what is the difference in the value between the next bet, the next state we encounter and the current state. And of course you have the gamma in front of the V, which is the output of the critic network, because we always discount the values of the um, next states because we don't know the full dynamics of the environment. And so the, that reward is uncertain. There's always some uncertainty around state transitions. And then in the top equation, you just sum that, uh, where you're going to be summing over gamma multiplied by lambda. So uh, this quantity gamma is, again, the normal gamma, 0 0.99, that we typically use. But this parameter lambda is a type of smoothing parameter. It helps to reduce variance. And we're going to use a value of 0 0.95. And for implementation, we're just going to use uh, a couple of nested for loops. So you're going to start out at time t equals 0, and then sum from that step all the way up to capital T minus 1. So if we have 20 states, you're going to go from 0 to uh, capital T minus 1, 0 to 18. And you have to do that because you have the V of S sub t plus 1. You don't want to try to evaluate something beyond uh, the number of actual states that you have. That won't work out right. Um, and so it's going to be relatively straightforward once you see it in action. And we're going to be keeping track of that gamma times lambda, which is a multiplicative constant that increases its power by one with each uh, iteration of the inner loop. All that will be made clear in the code. Uh, but fortunately, the critic loss is a little bit more straightforward. So we need something called the return. So um, the return is just equal to the sum of the advantage and the critic value based on the memory. So whatever the agent estimated the value of a particular state to be at the time that it took it is what we're going to be using for the critic value in our return. And then the loss of the critic is just going to be the mean squared error uh, between the return and the critic value based on the current values of the deep neural network. So once again, we're going to be passing the states through the critic network to get its estimate of values. And we're going to be also using the values from the memory as well. So relatively straightforward, even easier when you see it in code.
So we have two different losses and we have to sum them. And so that'll be the sum of the clipped actor and critic. So a couple things to note here is that one, we're actually doing gradient descent. And so the coefficient of C1 for the loss of our um, critic is going to be positive and uh, the um, loss of our actor is going to be negative because we are doing gradient ascent and not gradient descent. We have to multiply by negative one. Other thing to note is that we have this other parameter here, C2, this coefficient multiplied by S. S is an entropy term and that only comes into play when you have a deep uh, neural network with shared lower layers and actor and critic outputs at the top. So we don't have to worry about that in our particular implementation in this tutorial because we're doing two separate networks for the actor and the critic. And I'm going to use a coefficient of 0 0.5 for the um, loss for the critic. As I said, we're not going to be implementing the entropy term because we're doing two distinct networks. Um, we can also use this for continuous actions. There you would use a different output for your uh, actor network. Uh, and indeed, that's what the paper really is geared for, uh, is for continuous action spaces. Uh, but we're going to be doing the very simple discrete case. Other thing we won't implement is the multi-core CPU implementation because that introduces even more complexity. We're just going to be using the GPU. So what do we need for this project? We're going to need a class for the replay buffer, and we're just going to use lists for this. Normally I like to use NumPy arrays, but in this case lists turn out to be a simpler implementation, so that's what we're going to go with. We're also going to need a class for our actor network and a class for the critic network. We'll need a class for agent that's going to tie everything together. That'll have actor and critics that invoke actor and critic uh, constructors, as well as a memory uh, for storing the appropriate data. It'll also have functions for choosing actions, storing memories, saving models, and learning from its experiences. And in a separate file, we're going to have a main loop to train and evaluate the performance of our agent. Before we get into the coding section, I want to do a quick shout out to William Woodall. He hangs out in our Discord channel, which is also linked in the description below if you want to come hang out uh, with some really, really smart people who talk about uh, artificial intelligence ranging from all sorts of different things every single day. Check the link in the description for the Discord. So William came to me and said, hey Phil, I found an implementation of PPO that I find to be in line with your general philosophy of software minimalism. And he showed it to me, and I looked at it, and it helped clarify quite a few questions I had after reading the paper. Now, the software you see here is pretty much my own code, but it was inspired by William Woodall's code. So, shout out to him for helping me out on this, because the paper really isn't all that clear to me, um, even after reading it a few times. Other thing I want to say, uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about this in the coding section, is that when I normally define deep neural networks, actors and critics in particular, I will use the convention of saying self.layer name equals nn.linear, uh, self.layer name next, you know, equals nn.linear, and then I'll write the feed forward function where you use the um, member variables that self.layer1 as something you can call as an object to call, and then calling activation functions within that. Now, what I found is that doesn't really work very well. In fact, I have to use nn.sequential to create the models for this, and that's one of the biggest takeaways I had from William Woodall's code, is that uh, by using the nn.sequential, you really get this thing to work, and for whatever reason, I cannot get as good a performance using my conventional, typical way of writing these networks. Now, that I can't think of any reason why that should be the case, but it is something I've observed. I tested it uh, just altering that one chunk of code, how I define the models, and running it several times to take into account run-to-run -run variation, and it seems to be repeatable for me. So maybe, I don't know, maybe it's a configuration issue on my system. Maybe it's something I'm doing wrong elsewhere. I don't know. I don't think so. All of that out of the way, let's go ahead and get into the coding portion. All right, so let's go ahead and jump right into it with our imports. They're going to be pretty light. We'll need OS to handle file joining operations. NumPy for NumPy type stuff, and all of the torch packages. We'll need an N for our sequential model. We will need Optim, and we will also need our categorical distribution. So 
So we'll start with our PPO memory class. And this will be pretty simple for the most part. The only input for our constructor is a batch size. And we will just implement the memory with lists. So we'll keep track of the states encountered, the log probs, I'll just call it probs for brevity, the values that our critic calculates, the actions we actually took, rewards received, and the terminal flags. So next we need our function to generate our batches. So our strategy is going to be the following. We're going to have a list of integers that correspond to the indices of our memories. And then we're going to have batch size chunks of those memories. So indices from 0 to, say, 4, and then 5 to 10, so on and so forth, or whatever our batch size is. And we're going to shuffle up those indices and take those batch size chunks of those shuffled indices. So the first thing we need to know are the number of states we are going to want to get our batch start list or array I suppose that'll go from 0 to n states in batch size steps batch size it would help if I could type our indices and that is just the number of states in our trajectory um, we're going to want to shuffle that so that we handle the stochastic part of the mini batch, stochastic gradient ascent. And then we can go ahead and take our batches using a list comprehension. So it's going to be those indices from i to i plus self.batch size for i in range for i in batch start. So it's going to take all of the possible starting points of the batches, either 0, 5, 10, etc., and go for, uh, in the indices from that all the way up to i plus batch size. So we're going to get the whole batch from our indices. And then we're going to want to return an array for each of those. And this gets a little bit messy. And I have to be very careful not to mess up the order because of course the order in which you return the memories definitely matters later on. We'll need rewards. And then we're also going to want to return the batches. And the reason why will become apparent later, uh, it's because we're returning the entire array here and we're going to want to iterate over the batches. So now we need a function to store a memory and that'll take a state, action, probability, value, reward, and done as input. And all we're going to do is append each of those elements to the respective list. That is reward singular. And then finally, we need a function to clear the memory at the end of every trajectory. And I forgot the self argument here. <clears throat> And mini rant here, I really don't like some aspects of Python. Uh, it took me much longer than I would care to admit to get this to run. Not because the algorithm I implemented was incorrect, but because I had a mismatch. So here I had, I believe, action, and up here it was actions, or perhaps vice versa in my original implementation. So it didn't flag as an error, uh, because it's not really an error, particularly where Python is concerned. and uh, uh, so it was quite a nuisance, uh, pretty, pretty painful to track that down. Um, of course, if it were a more strongly typed language, then that wouldn't be an issue, but I digress. So now let's handle our actor network. And that will derive from the base nn.module class. Our initializer is going to be pretty straightforward. For our actor, we will need the number of actions. 
the input dims, a learning rate alpha, number of fully connected dims for the first and second fully connected layers, and a checkpoint directory. And we're also gonna need to call our super constructor. And then create our checkpoint file. Checkpoint directory and actor torch PPO. Now, I do it this way because I'll often do development in a single root directory and I don't wanna get models mixed up. If you have a different way, a more organized way of writing software, then you could perhaps skip this path join operation and just use a file uh, by itself. But let's move on to the actual deep neural network. Uh, we're gonna want a linear layer that takes star input dim. So we're gonna unpack the input dim. So we have to pass in a list and it's gonna output FC1 dims a ReLU activation function, another linear layer that takes FC1 dims as input and outputs FC2 dims. That gets a ReLU activation as well. Another linear layer that takes FC2 dims as input and outputs a number of actions. And then we're gonna use a softmax activation along the minus one uh, dimension. So that's the whole of our actor network. The softmax takes care of the fact that we're dealing with probabilities and they have to sum to one. So our optimizer is gonna be an atom optimizer. What are we gonna optimize? The parameters with the learning rate of alpha. Of course, we need to handle the device. should be our GPU if possible. And then we wanna send the entire network to the device. Next, we have our feed forward function, and that'll take a single state or batch of states as input. So we wanna pass that state through our deep neural network and get the distribution out. And then use that to define a categorical distribution which we are going to return. So what this is doing is it is calculating a series of probabilities that we're gonna to use to draw from a distribution to get our actual action. And then we can use that to get the log probabilities for the calculation of the ratio of the two probabilities in our update uh, for our learning function. Then we have a couple of bookkeeping functions, save checkpoint. Uh, we're gonna to wanna to say torch.save state dictionary for our network and we're going to save that into a checkpoint file then we need a load checkpoint and that is self.load state dictionary what are we going to load a checkpoint file and that's really it for the actor network it's pretty straightforward uh, the critic network is also straightforward And that also derives from nn.module. Here we don't need the number of actions because the output of the critic is single valued. It just outputs the value of a particular state, so it doesn't care how many actions there are in the action space. But it does need a learning rate alpha. It does need some dimensions to 56 and a checkpoint directory. And then we need to call the super constructor. And same deal with the checkpoint file. Um, the checkpoint directory and critic torch. So that way we can differentiate between the actor and critic model files. And we will again use a sequential model. And so uh, in the shout out, I was talking about William Woodall's implementation as well as something else I observed. So what I meant by the alternate method of doing a model was if you say self.fc1 and in linear 
you know if you do it that way have fc1 fc2 the separate layers defined without the sequential model it actually does significantly worse than if you do it with the sequential model and i don't know why i don't have a certainly there's no theoretical reason it should do it it must be something under the hood with the way in which pytorch is implementing things and uh it's no disrespect to the creators of pytorch but this is one of my you know one of my biggest gripes with using these third party um libraries is you never know how they're implemented so if something doesn't operate the way you expect you can certainly go look it up it's open source but that is much easier said than done right you have to be familiar with not the entire code base, but a really significant portion of it to be able to make sense of a single file or a single way of doing things. So it really makes things opaque. It's an abstraction on top of an abstraction. Um, and so, I don't know, it's part of the good, uh, part of the, it's the bad that comes with the good for having, you know, a robust library like PyTorch. But I do it this way because it seems to work the best. And as an aside, I also can't get it to work very well in uh, TensorFlow 2. And I suspect the re the reasons are related because the performance of the TensorFlow 2 is on par with uh, the type of performance I get from doing it uh, the other way, where you just define individual layers instead of a sequential model. So pretty interesting stuff. Maybe one day I'll get super motivated and decide to go ahead and figure it out, but I wouldn't hold my breath on that. So this is going to be a very similar model, linear layers with ReLU activations in between. The main difference is that our output layer is going to be a linear layer with no activation and a single value output. Now, of course, it handles the batch size automatically. So if you pass in a batch, you're going to get a batch of outputs as well. Again, we need our optimizer with learning rate of alpha. As an aside about the optimizer, um, I'm going to use the same learning rate for both the actor and the critic, and it's entirely feasible and possible and perhaps even advisable to use separate learning rates for both the actor and the critic. Uh, at least in something like deep deterministic policy gradients, you get away with a much larger, you know, by a factor of three or so learning rate for your critic than you do the actor. Uh, reason being, as we outlined in the lecture, the actor is much more sensitive to changes in the underlying parameters of its deep neural network. Uh, now, ostensibly or theoretically, the, the PPO method should account for that and allow you to use uh, a similar learning rate because the actor should be less sensitive than in the case of DDPG, but I haven't tested it. So one thing you can do in your spare time is play around with differing learning rates for both the actor and the critic. Our forward feed forward function is pretty straightforward. You want to pass a state through your critic network and return that value. And we're going to need um, saving and loading checkpoints. I am just going to yank and paste those because the functions are otherwise identical. And so that is it for our two networks. Now we come to the heart of the problem, which is the agent class. Do I have an extra? Yes, I do. And this, of course, does not derive from anything. This is our base agent class. We need a number of actions. A default value for gamma, which is the discount factor in the calculation of our advantages. Typically, we use something like 0 0.99. A learning rate of 0 0.00, uh, 3 by 10 to the minus 4. Uh, I got this from the paper. So, um, if you read the paper, they do give you the hyperparameters and a little bit of detail around the networks they used. But it's not a very well-written paper. It's rather obtuse. Um, so, I'm not a huge fan of it. Uh, but uh, we do have some good default values from it. So policy clip. So in my cheat sheet here, I have a value of 0 0.1 as a default. Um, although in the paper they use 0 0.2, perhaps I was experimenting. I will have to be careful with that. A batch size of 64, a default end of 2048. So that is the horizon, the number of steps before we perform an update. 
and a default for the number of epochs. Now these parameters come from um, these parameters come from the values for um, continuous environments. So the actual numbers we're going to be using are going to be significantly smaller. As I said, we'll use an n of 20, uh, three epochs, a batch size of five instead of 64. And I'm going to go ahead and set that policy clip to 0 0.2. Uh, now that I'm looking at it, we need a GAE lambda. That is the lambda parameter. But of course, you can't use lambda because that is a reserved word for Python. What else do we need? Um, yeah, I think I'm missing something in my other file here. It's okay, I'll fix it on the fly. So then we go ahead and save our parameters. Uh, number of epochs. And our GA lambda. We need our actor network. Input dims and learning rate. Takes input dims and alpha. BBO memory batch size input one second. All right, hopefully that is not as loud now. Uh, the toddler is playing with his grandparents, always a hoot. So now we need a function that handles the interface between the agent and its memory. Um, and it's just gonna be very simple self memory store memory. It's just an interface function. Then we need a function to save our models. Uh, print saving models. That is just gonna be an interface function between the agent and the save checkpoint functions for the underlying deep neural networks. And very similar for the load models function. Now we have a visitor. All right, that is it for our bookkeeping functions. Next we need something to handle choosing an action. That'll take an observation of the current state of the environment as input. And we want to convert that NumPy array to a torch tensor. And we're going to add a batch dimension because the deep neural network expects a batch dimension. And we'll be sure to specify that it is a float. And then we're going to go ahead and pass that through our neural network. So dist equals self.actor state. That'll give us our distribution for choosing an action. We need the value of that particular state. And then to get our action, we just sample our distribution. Uh, and then what we want to do is go ahead and squeeze to get rid of those batch dimensions. And this might be something I added uh, for TensorFlow 2. I'm not, I don't remember if Torch requires it, but it doesn't hurt anything. So for the probs, we want to go ahead and return the log probability of the action we actually took dot item. So dot item will give you an integer. And likewise, for the action, we want to squeeze it and get the action, the item out. And similarly for the value and then just return all three. So this will make our main function look a little bit different than we're used to, because we're gonna be accepting three values from our choose action function instead of one, uh, but that's necessary for keeping track of the probabilities and values as well. Next, we come to the meat of the problem, so to speak, our learning function. So we want to iterate over the number of epochs. So we're gonna have, in this case, three epochs. At the top of every epoch, we want to get our arrays, the old probabilities, the values, 
the reward, the duns, and the batches. Let's do that. Um, and then I'm just going to use a different notation here and uh, go ahead and start calculating our advantages. So our advantage is just going to be a NumPy array of zeros, len reward, type MP float 32. And we're gonna say for T in range, so for each time step, len a reward array minus one because we don't wanna overwrite the or go beyond the bounds of our array. Our discount factor is going to be one. The advantage at each time step starts out at zero. So we're k in range. So we're going to start out at t and go from t to the same reward array minus one and say a sub t plus equals discount. So that GAE times lambda factor, uh, which starts out as one times, we need parentheses, reward array, sub k, plus self dot gamma, times values, k plus one, times, um, one minus int done array, k, minus values, sub k. And then we say discount times equals self dot gamma times G -A -E, lambda and at the end of every calculation at the end of every k steps advantage sub t equals at a sub t and at the end we're going to turn advantage to a tensor in particular a CUDA tensor and this is just a strict implementation of the equation from the paper so this uh, right here in parentheses is the delta sub t. So it's a reward plus a gamma times v sub t plus one minus v sub t, where you know, we swap the k and t here. Um, and you need the one minus duns uh, on the values as a multiplicative factor of the values of t, sub t plus one because the value of the terminal state is identically zero. That's just a convention in reinforcement learning it, it predates the deep neural network stuff it's just how we handle it it's assumed that's why they don't put it in the calculation it is assumed it's just a matter of convention and then that discount is the gae and the lambda multiplied by the gamma that takes care of the multiplicative factor so it is the the gamma lambda to the uh t minus one power or is it t minus k minus one, something like that power uh, multiplied by the delta. And then you're summing it all up. So now we have our advantage. Um, I'm gonna convert the values to a tensor as well. And I fully admit here that going from val's array to, you know what, in fact, let's do this. Now let's leave it the way it is. Uh, it may not be the most uh, effective, or excuse me, the most uh, efficient way of doing it, but sometimes I just get stuff to work and then don't go back and clean it up. If you want to clean it up, please do so. I always invite that. And it looks like I'm missing something here because it is um, not automatically indenting, so I'm probably missing a parenthesis somewhere and it is right here I believe if I am not mistaken yeah there it goes alright so then states is just gonna be a tensor state array sub batch d type t dot float to self dot actor dot device and we're kind of violating the pep 8 style guides their style guide by going beyond 80 characters but I think we'll be all right. Old probabilities gets converted to a tensor. And I don't need an explicit D type there, I don't think. Dot device dot two 
So thought actor device that works, and then actions. Okay, and then um, so we have the states we encountered, the old probabilities according to our old actor parameters, the actions we actually took. Uh, the next parameter we need, so we have the bottom of that numerator, pi theta old, we need pi theta new. So we have to take the states that we encountered and pass them through the actor network and get a new distribution to calculate that new, those new probabilities. And we'll also need the uh, value of the the new values of the states according to the updated values of the critic network. So you may as well get those now. And we can squeeze those. And then we can calculate our new probabilities. And take the prob ratio. So here I'm going to exponentiate the log probs to get the probabilities and take the ratio. You could also do this. Those two are equivalent by the properties of exponent, uh, exponents, um, exponentials, excuse me. And then we're going to calculate our weighted probabilities and, sorry, our probability ratio. Um, no, yeah, the weighted probabilities I think I have two lines that do the same thing in there. That's funny. And that's going to be the advantage uh, batch times the probability ratio. Then we need the weighted clipped probabilities. And that is going to be the clamp of the prob ratio between one minus self dot policy clip and one plus self dot policy clip multiplied by advantage sub batch. Now our actor loss is going to be the uh, negative minimum of the weighted probs or the weighted clipped probs dot mean. And our returns for our critic loss are going to be the advantage plus the values for that particular batch. And so our critic loss then is going to be the returns minus critic value squared and the mean value. Our total loss after loss plus 0 0.5 times critic loss. Remember we're doing gradient ascent and there's a negative sign in front of the actor. Um, so we're not doing descent. That's another thing that's kind of suboptimal about the way the paper is written. Uh, you can get kind of confused about negative signs if you're not paying very careful attention. Next we have to zero our gradients. I think you can probably hear that my son is <laughs> giving a concert downstairs. He's playing the drums by whacking on his toy box with some drumsticks. Um, so we're going to back propagate our total loss and then step our optimizers. And finally, uh, at the end of every epoch, yeah, I think that's the right indentation. We want to clear our memory. So at the end of all, whoops, at the end of all the epochs, we want to clear our memory. Let me just make sure I'm not doing that. Each epoch, no, I am not. Okay, that is good. So now let's do a right quit, and I have an indentation error here. I see. Oh, that came in when I did the uh, yank and paste. All right, so that is it for our um, 
agent file, let's go ahead and take a look at main. So we start with our imports. We'll need Jim. We'll need NumPy to uh, keep track of the running average of our scores from PPO Torch. We'll need our agent. And if you're new here, I have a utility file that I use a map.lib pyplot function to plot the running average of the previous 100 games for the learning curve. It's pretty trivial. You can just do a plot of the running average. Um, just do a git clone if you want to use my exact version. I don't go over it in every video because it's kind of redundant, but I leave a link in the description to the GitHub. So um, go ahead and do a, a clone of that so you have that file or just write your own. So we're going to use the very basic cart pull v0. Uh, reason being, uh, we don't need to spend a whole lot of time on a very computationally complex environment to realize we made a mistake. So it's very easy to see if something got screwed up with the cart pull environment. This certainly will work on more advanced environments, but it does require a little bit of um, fine tuning. So uh, we'll just start with the cart pull and then you can play around with other environments at your leisure. So we'll use the parameters I dictated in the lecture, I think I changed the number of epochs to four. Running rate of three. We can get the number of actions directly from our environment. Very handy. Uh, pass in all the other relevant parameters. get the number of input dimensions from our environment. And we're only going to play 300 games. As I'm looking at this, I do realize that uh, in the parameters I did the last time I ran it, I did do a policy clip of 0 0.1. But 0 0.2 comes from the paper, and I'm, I'm pretty sure it works both ways. So we will find out. If we need to, we can go back and change the policy clip. Uh, not a big deal. So plot slash cart pull dot PNG. We need to keep track of our best score. This is a minimum score for the environment. An empty list for our score history. And um, number of learn times we call the learn function. You can make this a member variable of your agent if you want and an average score starting out of zero. We don't actually need that, but whatever. So we'll say at the top of every episode, I'm going to reset our environment, set the terminal flag to false, and accumulate a score to zero. While we're not done, we need to choose an action based on the current state of the environment. Um, get the new state reward done and debug info back from the environment. <laughs> Increment our score by the reward and store that transition in the agent's memory. Reward and done. And if n, oh, I do need an extra variable here. We'll say n steps equals zero, and that's the number of steps we've taken. We need that because we have to know how often or when it's time to perform the learning uh, function. So every time we take an action, the number of steps goes up by one. So if n steps modulus n equals zero, then agent.learn iters plus equals one. And then no matter what happens, we want to set the current state to the new state of the environment and the end of every episode, append our score and calculate our mean. 
and that's the previous 100 games. If that average score is better than the best known score, then set that best score to the current average and save your models. And we also want some debug information. Is so I score Of course, that should be an average score. The uh, I like to print out. This isn't necessary, but the number of steps that have transpired in total, and the number of times the agent has called the learning function. This gives you an idea. Uh, this is I did this because when I compare with the results of the paper. Um, it wasn't clear to me if they were talking about the number of times they called the learning function or the actual absolute number of uh, time steps in the environment. Uh, so I print out both. These time steps and learning steps are totally optional. You don't have to print it out. It's not something that is required. So I just do it for my own clarification. We need an x-axis for our plot. Len score history and plot learning. Oh, certainly, let's do this. We don't wanna do it every single game. We wanna do it at the end of all games. All right, now moment of truth. Let's see how many typos I made. So it's telling me and it got an unexpected argument input dims. That's interesting. What do I call it? I don't have it there. Oh. And the reason is my computer had a hard lockup and I had to do a reboot. And it mutilated my cheat sheet for this. So there's bound to be some errors in here. Ah, I didn't do my make directories, so temp, ppo, and plots. Let's try it again. Name duns array is not defined. It's probably done array. That is in line 161. So it is duns array. Yeah. We'll just change it there, I guess. Old prob array is not defined. That's probably the same thing. Uh, where am I? Yeah, old prob array. <laughs> and I'll, I'll do the opposite here. I'll make it singular, just for just for the sake of not being consistent. Index eight is out of bounds. Okay, so then something has gone extremely wonky with the generation of the batches. Um, okay, let's take a look at that. Oh wait, let's read this a little bit more carefully. It says index eight is out of bounds for axis zero with size zero. So our action array, oh, you know what? Let's take a look at our memory. So it's action array. So here we have self.actions uh, we return the self actions self dot ah there we go that's why so actions dot append action all right now let's try it name advantage is not defined that is a typo that is in line one eighty three. A advantage that I yeah let's try that let's try once more has no memory underscore clear memory it's memory dot clear memory 197 
right, so now it is running. So I'll let that go for a few minutes and we will see how it does. All right, so it has been running for a little bit, just a few minutes now. It runs relatively quickly. And what I'm seeing is that we do get some oscillations in performance. You see it'll hit 200 for you know several games in a row and then it'll drop down into the mid 100s even you know 66 something relatively low like that and there's a little chunk here where it dips below 100 points so uh, it's not a silver bullet but it looks to be recovering so we'll give it another 80 runs and see how it does okay so it has finished up and you can see that it finished strong with a long run of about 50 games, 45 games of a score of 200. So uh, I commented when I was writing the agent that I was looking at my cheat sheet and had a policy clip value of 0 0.1. It could be that I had settled on that value based on some experimentation um, and then changed it back just to be more consistent with the paper for this particular video. Uh, so that's something I would play with. Uh, other thing to consider is that there is significant run-to-run -run variation that is a facet of pretty much every algorithm in deep reinforcement learning. It just has to do with the way the neural networks are initialized as well as how the uh, number, uh, random number generators initialize the environment. So um, when you see papers, they'll typically report uh, average values for say 5 or 10 or whatever number of games and then a band to show the range of variance for run-to-run -run variation. Uh, but this is clear evidence of learning, you know, it achieves a score of 200 and under 300 games. Uh, so I call this good. To me, this is fully functional. Now, there are a number of things you can do to improve on this. You can get it to work with continuous environments. You can bolt on uh, some stuff for doing um, Atari games where you would need to add in convolutional neural networks uh, as your input layers and then flatten them out to pass them to a uh, linear layer for the actor and the critic. And you can see my earlier video on an AI learns to beat Pong for Q learning. There I go over all of the, um, a lot of the stuff you need to do to modify the OpenAI Gem Atari environment uh, to do frame repeating. That's something they do in Q learning. Uh, that's an exercise to the reader. Um, actually, I don't know, uh, thinking back to the paper, I don't recall if they actually do any frame repeating or not in this particular algorithm PBO. Uh, but it's just something to look at anyway. Uh, so there's a number of things you can do to improve upon it. Uh, I haven't added this module to my course yet. Uh, I'm still working on it. I really want to uh, take some time to give more thought to the paper because the paper isn't very well written. And I'll probably have to do a lecture like what I did for uh, this YouTube video in the course because the paper isn't very easy to implement just by reading it. So I hope that was helpful. That is PPO in just a few hundred lines, uh, full implementation in PyTorch, solving the carpool environment. Then you can easily modify this to do other environments as you wish. If you've made it this far, please consider subscribing. Hit the bell icon, leave a like, a comment down below, and I'll see you in the next video. Welcome to a crash course in soft diatrocritic methods. You're going to learn the least painful way to quickly implement the soft diatrocritic algorithm using TensorFlow 2. We're going to implement this and test it on the PyBullet environment, the inverted pendulum, because it's relatively quick to compute. It runs pretty fast, so we'll know whether or not we got it right relatively quickly. So what exactly is a soft diatrocritic algorithm? So this algorithm sets out to address a pretty fundamental issue in deep reinforcement learning, which is how do we use a maximum entropy framework in actor-critic methods? We're going to go a little more detail into this in a moment, but that is the basic idea behind what we want to do. So why would this even be something worth considering? Well, as you may be aware, actor-critic methods have a number of fundamental limitations not the least of which is the fact that they have what is called brutal convergence, meaning that they suffer from a high degree of hyperparameter tuning. If you go monkeying around with hyperparameters, the agent breaks and doesn't know what to do in the environment. And so once you find a set of hyperparameters, you really have to stick with them. Worse than that, you have a problem called high sample complexity, which is just a fancy way of saying you need to play a whole bunch of games for the agent to figure out how it works. It's not very efficient for environments in which you have a large number, uh, large state spaces and high 
uh, number of actions in a continuous action space. Worst of all, these two fundamental drawbacks really limit real-world applicability and is probably one of the big reasons behind why we haven't seen any widespread adoption of deep reinforcement learning in something like, say, robotics. So soft enter critic, as I said, uh, is a maximum entropy framework. And what this means specifically is that the agent is going to maximize both long-term rewards and entropy. Well, what does entropy even mean in this context? Well, if you're not familiar with the concept of entropy, it's strictly speaking a measure of disorder in your system. It stems from statistical physics and thermodynamics. Uh, it's basically the log of the multiplicity of your system, the number of ways of arranging the components of your system. What does that mean in the context of deep reinforcement learning? It means the randomness of the actions of your agent. And you might wonder, why would you want to maximize both long-term rewards and randomness of your agent. The reason, the reason is that we need to have some degree of random actions to test our model of the world. The agent starts out knowing absolutely nothing about the world and so should act as randomly as possible. And then as it starts to figure out what actions lead to rewards, it should eventually start to converge on taking mostly those actions, but still spend some time exploring to make sure that there isn't some better action out there. This isn't a totally alien concept to you if you're familiar to Q-learning or familiar with Q-learning. Uh, there we use what's called epsilon greedy action selection where some proportion of the time, say 10% of the time, we take a random action no matter what. Even if we know what the best possible action is, we may still take a totally random action simply because you can never be 100% certain that you're right. In this algorithm, we're gonna be modeling entropy by reward scaling. So we're gonna have a multiplicative factor for our reward. And there's gonna be an inverse relationship between our reward scale and the degree of entropy in the system. And you can kind of think of this intuitively uh, because if you increase the scaling on the reward, you're gonna increase the contribution of that reward to the cost function. And so you're gonna kind of tilt the neural network parameters towards maximizing that reward. Whereas if you lower that parameter, then you're going to uh, lessen the contribution of the signal of the reward to the updates of the neural network and so decrease its overall importance to the cost function. This algorithm is also going to leverage all the neural networks possible. We're going to have networks for actors, uh, value network, and critic networks. And in particular, we're actually going to have two critic networks, uh, which is going to be an exact analog of the double Q learning algorithm, as well as twin delayed deep deterministic policy gradients, another awesome algorithm for continuous action space environments. Uh, please see other videos on this channel if you don't know much about those. I have m a multitude of videos covering both of those topics. They also make use of another in, uh, innovation from Q-Learning, which is the use of a target value function. So the idea here is that we're going to be using our value function to track the values of states to tell us which states are viable so we can you know, seek out those states again. That's the idea behind reinforcement learning. Uh, but the problem is that we're going to be updating that value function with each time step. And so if you're updating it at each time step and using it to evaluate the values of the states, then you're really chasing a moving target. And so uh, the algorithm will suffer from uh, instability. And that happens a lot in Q-learning as well. The solution is to have a target value function, uh, which is uh, updated only periodically or very slowly. So in Q-learning, we do a periodic update where we just exactly copy the networks, uh, the network parameters from one network to another, from the online to the target network. Uh, here we're gonna make use of a soft update where it's gonna be some kind of moving average of the online and previous values of this uh, target value network. And I'll show you that equation later in this little lecture. So our actor network is gonna model both the mean and sigma of a distribution. So this is a probabilistic uh, policy. It is not a deterministic policy like in DDPG. So we're, our uh, actor network is gonna output two parameters, a mean and sigma, and then we're gonna put that mean and sigma into a normal distribution and sample it to get an action. Now the original paper used what they call a reparameterization trick, and I will fully admit I'm a little fuzzy on exactly what that means. It kind of sounds like they are sampling some normal distribution and then adding on some additional noise to it. Um, 
I implement this in what I, I do a, what I believe to be a faithful implementation of this in PyTorch, but I'm not going to do it in this tutorial. I think it's a little superfluous and I'm actually getting, you know, um, really good results without it. So I'm kind of throwing it away. We do have a special function to enforce action bounds as well as to calculate the log of the probabilities of taking some actions because the log of the probability will uh, play a big role in our update rules for our networks, which I'll get to momentarily. And I'll show you that function later on in lecture as well. Another thing to note is that we can use multiple steps of gradient descent like we do in proximal policy optimization or PPO, uh, but we're not gonna do that. We're gonna just use one step of atom, op atom optimization per time step of the environment. Some other implementation notes. We're going to have a replay buffer based on NumPy arrays. Uh, I prefer NumPy arrays. That is by no means the only way to do it. Not even necessarily the best way. It's just my preferred solution. Change that if you want. Now we're going to keep track of the states the agent sees, the actions it took, the rewards it received, the new states that resulted from those actions as well as the terminal flags from our environment and the terminal flags are important because we have to use that in the update for our deep neural networks because when we're evaluating the values of states we have to take into account whether or not that state was terminal the reason is that terminal states have no value because the episode is over and no future rewards follow the value is just the present uh, value of the discounted future rewards so if the reward is if the episode is done it's zero by default now this is the equation I alluded to earlier where we are calculating the log of the probability of selecting some action given some state. That's what that pi means. It's a probability of selecting an action which is a continuous parameter given some state. This mu is our actual sample of a, of a distribution with mean and sigma given by our deep neural network. So it is not the output of our deep neural network. It is the um, sampling of a distribution where the mean and sigma are given by our deep neural network. And uh, another thing to note here is that we are going to have to multiply our action by the max action from the environment. Reason being is that uh, the action is going to be proportional to the tan hyperbolic function, and that is bounded by plus or minus one, which uh, not all environments are bound by plus or minus one, so you want to take into account that fact. We don't want to cut off half of our action space arbitrarily. So let's talk about updating our deep neural networks. Our actor network update is pretty straightforward. What we're going to do is sample states from our buffer, but compute new actions. So this is an off policy learning method where we're going to be using samples generated by one policy to update some newer policy. Uh, we're going to stick those uh, states through our uh, actor network and get new actions out on the other end compute that log prob based on what we saw on the previous slide and then we're going to subtract off the minimum value of the two critics so we're going to pass the states sampled from our buffer the actions computed in our update uh, according to the current values of our actor network and then take the minimum of the critic evaluation of those state and action pairs this is kind of the double q uh, learning rule in action so that's why it as q min and the one over n sum tells you that we're taking a mean of that quantity that difference our value network update is a little bit more convoluted so we're gonna have one half the mean squared error that's what the one over n and the one half of the difference squared tells you of the difference between the value function uh, using the current parameters of our value function for the state sampled from our buffer again we're gonna subtract off the minimum of the q values um, where the actions are chosen according to the new values of our actor network and we're going to again subtract off that log of pi where again the actions are sub uh, computed according to the current values of our actor network and again the log is computed according to a couple slides ago the target value network on the other hand doesn't get any gradient descent to determine its new parameters we're going to be updating its parameters with uh, the following equation so we're going to take this hyperparameter tau and multiply it by the values of our online value network given by psi. That's just the symbol for the uh, parameters for our value network. And we're going to add on 1 minus tau, so 0.995, multiplied by the current values of the 
target value network, uh, take the sum of those two and upload those values to our target value network. And it's a slowly moving average of online and target networks. Our critic network gets uh, a rather interesting update. So here, both critics get updated. So there's no minimum op operation here. So there's two cost functions, one for each critic. And it's just given by the mean squared error of the difference between the output of the critic uh, for the states and actions sampled from the buffer. And we're not calculating new actions here. That is one difference between the update of the critic and the actor and value networks. And we're subtracting off this quantity Q hat. And that is where the actual entropy comes into play. So it is a scaled reward plus the values of the new states according to our target value network. So this is where all the magic of the algorithm happens. That's where the maximum entropy framework comes into play in this one little equation. Kind of neat, huh? So we're going to need a whole bunch of data structures. Uh, class for our replay buffer. Again, that'll be NumPy arrays. The actor network gets a class. The critic network gets a class. So does the value network. Our agent gets its own class, and that's going to tie everything together. That'll have functionality for choosing actions, saving models, learning, as well as saving memories. And we will have a main loop to train and evaluate the performance of our agent. Now we're going to need a number of packages. We'll need TensorFlow. I prefer GPU, obviously. This is a highly computationally expensive algorithm. So if you have the GPU, please use it. We'll need PyBullet for environment, Jim, of course, NumPy, and TensorFlow-probability. That is uh, the only way we can get access to this probability distribution. They're not built into the base TensorFlow package for some reason. Okay, that's it for a mini lecture, your crash course. Now let's go ahead and throw you in the water and start coding. All right, so let's go ahead and get started with our buffer class, and then we'll move on to do our networks and our agent class. So we're going to be using NumPy arrays for our memories, and so NumPy, is our, NumPy will be our only package dependence for this particular part of the agent, we'll need a max size, input shape, and number of actions as input. We will need uh, to save our max size, and we'll also need a mem counter to keep track of the first available memory position. And our agent's memory is represented by numpy arrays that we will initialize as zeros in the shape mem size by input shape or input shape is some uh, tuple or list. We need the new state memory as well. That are the new states that the agent sees as a consequence of the actions it takes in the environment. We need the action memory, and that is in shape mem size by number of actions. Keep in mind number of actions means number of components to the action since these are continuous actions. They will have uh, components along some dimension in action space. It's not a actual number of discrete actions. It's a little bit misaptly named. A reward memory, and that's just a vector, and an array to keep track of the um, terminal flags we receive from the environment. And I'll go ahead and say that is num, uh, type numpy bool. Next, we need a function to store, trans, uh, store a transition. And if it isn't clear, the reason we need to store the terminal flags is because the value of the terminal state is always zero because no future rewards follow the terminal state. And so it has no value. So we will need to save all those parameters in our agent's memory. And we wanna know what is the position of the first available memory. And that's given by the modulus of mem counter and mem size. This has the property that when we overwrite the agent's memory, we will go back to the very beginning. So we don't have to worry about going beyond the bounds of our array. So then we just go ahead and save our variables. and terminal memory. And most importantly, we need to increment our memory counter by one. 
Next, we need a function to sample our buffer. And I want to make an, a quick, I want to make a quick aside here. So in a question in the comment section, someone asked, um, uh, is there a way to sample memories according to how viable they were? You know, our early memories, the agent's acting randomly, doesn't know what it's doing. So what, you know, what good is it to sample those memories? Isn't it more important to sample memories where we kind of knew what we were doing and had some reasonable model of the environment? And you can do that in something like prioritized experience replay where you prioritize memories based on their utility. But in this case, we're just doing uh, uniform uh, sampling. So we just take the good with the bad. So we want to know the uh, first available memory, how far we have gone in our um, memory, and that's given by the minimum of the mem size and the mem counter. That's so that we're not, you know, if we've filled up half of our memory, we don't want to sample the latter half, which is all zeros. We only want to sample the first half, which is filled up with useful transitions. And so then we're going to go ahead and take a batch size of memories from uh, from our memory bank and go ahead and dereference them. Sorry, we need an extra space there. And then go ahead and return those states, actions, rewards, new states, and terminal flags. And that is it for our uh, memory buffer class. Next up, we're going to handle uh, our networks for the agent. So the first thing, obviously, we want to do is come up and fix our imports uh, because we're going to need more stuff than just NumPy. We're going to need OS, the base TensorFlow package, Keras, and we will need um, TensorFlow probability as TFP. Now you will have to install this package separately. It is not included in the base TensorFlow package. So see the TensorFlow documentation if that is something you don't know how to do, but you do need to do that installation separately. So our critic network will derive from Keras.model I guess is access to um, making use of the gradients and the gradient tape and all the other good stuff that we get from the base class. We will need a number of actions, a uh, number of F dims, FC1, FC2 dims, <clears throat> a name. So the name is useful for model checkpointing so we can keep track of which file corresponds to which network and a directory for saving models. You have to do a make dir on that, otherwise you'll get an error. First thing you want to do is call your super constructor, save the relevant parameters, One of these days I'm going to shorten this checkpoint dir name, uh, but not today. So then you want to join the uh, checkpoint file name, checkpoint directory, excuse me, with the name and underscore soft actor critic. So that way when we save a bunch of stuff in a single directory, we know which file corresponds to which algorithm. Next we can define our model. Our first fully connected layer is just a dense layer that has implied input dimensionality and takes uh, FC1 dims as output with a RAU activation. Likewise for our second layer. And our final output is single valued with, excuse me, single node with no activation. So we have to input a state and action to our call function because the critic network evaluates the values of state action pairs. And so the first thing we want to do is um, 
pass the concatenated state and action pair through the first fully connected layer. And we want to concatenate along the first axis. And pass that through the second fully connected layer. And pass that through the output layer. And return. Pretty straightforward there. Next, let's handle our value network. And again, that derives from keras.model. We don't have to specify any dimensionality here other than for our first and second fully connected layers. And we wanna call our super constructor again. And if you wanted to get really fancy, you could write a base model, a base network class, and then have everything derived from both the, I guess the base model class would derive from the Keras model, and then everything that derives from that would derive from the uh, base class, uh, base model, sorry, base network class, but that can get kind of messy really quickly. You have to deal with multiple inheritance. Uh, maybe it's not as hard as, I initially think it is, but it's an alternative path. It's an alternative way so that you don't have to keep writing like the same stuff over and over again. Because you notice there's a lot of overlap between the code of the networks, so you can fix that with inheritance. And our output is again going to be single valued with no activation. Now, the call function here only takes the current state of the environment as input. The value function is only concerned with the values of states, not state action pairs. Then we just go ahead and pass all of those through and return them. Pretty straightforward. The real difficulty doesn't occur until the uh, actor network and the difficulty will come in the call function as well as the sample normal. So uh, we want to pass in a max action. Am I using that here? Sorry, I always kind of make stuff on the fly, kind of modify stuff on the fly. Yeah, so we do need that. Uh, SC1 dims, SC2 dims, a name, number of actions. I'll use two by default. Again, this number of components and a checkpoint directory. I'm gonna call our super constructor. and save the relevant parameters. Okay, and then we have our model name. And just as, as an aside, you can't use name. It's a reserved variable. You can't say self.name equals name because name is reserved by the base class keras.model. So you have to use model name. So we're not going to be using reparameterization, but we will need some noise factor to make sure we don't get something that blows up when we take the log. You'll see what I mean very shortly. Our neural network by now should look pretty familiar. 
value activations. Here's where things get interesting. We're going to have a um, mu for our distribution as well as a sigma with no activation. So let's go ahead and handle our call function. So we're going to get our, um, I called it prob here, but I don't know if I like that name now that I'm rewriting it. But I'm going to roll with it. Uh, so mu, really that prob is just the input of our first two layers, uh, you know, the pass through the state through the first couple layers. We'll have our sigma, which is a standard deviation of our distribution. And we're going to want to clip this. Um, it may be the case that TensorFlow 2 doesn't need it, but when I was coding this up in PyTorch, uh, it the distribution would blow up if we had uh, a noise of, sorry, a sigma of zero. It didn't like a zero standard deviation distribution, which I can understand. I guess that's a direct delta function. It's not exactly something that you would encounter every day. And I think the TensorFlow might actually fail a little bit more gracefully than the PyTorch in that respect. But I go ahead and clip it so that it goes between one by 10 to the minus six and one. So we're gonna constrain the standard deviation here to not be too large. Uh, that is something you can optimize on your own. Uh, I don't do extensive and detailed studies on all of this stuff. I just get it working. Uh, check that it conforms to the um, uh, specifications laid out in the paper and that I get something reasonable on the output. But we're not done for the actor network. We have the output of our deep neural network, which is a mean and standard deviation for our distribution. Now we have to sample that distribution to get the actual action for our agent. And I've stuck it on a function called sample normal. And as I stated, we're not gonna be doing the reparameterization trick. Uh, I show students how to do that in the course. And in fact, in my PyTorch video, I show you how to do it. PyTorch has a very simple function called rsample that does basically the reparameterization for you. You can implement the code yourself um, if you really wanna be um, completionist about it, but uh, I'm not bothering here because I do get good results without it. It's kind of like with the DDPG paper where they use the Ornstein Uhlenbeck noise and then people that implemented it later kind of threw it away because they're like, wait a second, this is unnecessary complication. That kind of seems to be the case here where it works without it and is an, an unnecessary complication. But I mean, I could always be wrong, um, but I do get solid results without it. So here we're going to go ahead and instantiate our normal distribution defined by mu and sigma. And our action is going to be, um, our actions are going to be a sample, probabilities.sample. If you want to do the reparameterization, you'd reparameterize it there. And the action is math.tan hyperbolic times max action. That max action takes care of the fact that our environment may have max actions outside of the bounds plus or minus one, which are of course the bounds of the tan hyperbolic function. So you want to not arbitrarily cut off half of your action space if you don't have to. Our log probs, uh, it's probabilities, will it dot log prob of actions, and then go ahead and subtract off math log one minus uh, tf.math.pow, excuse me, action, so we're gonna square the action, plus self.reparam, called it noise, didn't I? Self.noise, and so then I had to change it here as well, don't I? Yeah, self.noise, plus self.noise, uh, do I have the right number of parentheses here? Yes, I do. And so since you have a logarithmic function here, you don't want to take the log of zero. That is oftentimes not advisable. So I just add in some really small number to make sure we're taking the log of something finite. So then we're going to go ahead and do a reduce sum on that. Log probs axis equals one. Keep dims equals true and return the action and log props. So that wraps up the 
uh, networks portion of our code. Now we have to handle the agent class, which will tie everything all together. So of course, again, we have to come back up to the top and add in some imports. We're going to need our optimizer. So we'll say from uh, TensorFlow Keras optimizers import Atom. And I think that's the only other uh, import we will need. And then we come back down here and start our agent class, which derives from nothing. Our initializer is going to take a number of learning rates. Now we're going to use um, two separate learning rates. You could, in principle, use three, one for the critic, one for the actor, one for the value network. In this case, we're going to use one single learning rate for the actor, and then the uh, same, uh, the beta learning rate will be for the value and critic networks. Input dims, something like eight. Uh, that's just the default for the lunar lander. It's the only um, default I know off the top of my head. We're going to want to pass in the environment to get some useful uh, information from it. A gamma, the discount factor for our um, update equation. Max size for our memory. A million transitions. Uh, default value of tau of 0 0.005. Layer one size, layer two size, 256. Batch size default, 256. And our reward scale default of two. Let's go ahead and start saving. Our replay buffer, max size, input dims, number of actions, pretty straightforward. Then we're going to go ahead and define our networks. So our max, max action is going to be the uh, high value of the action space from our environment. We need our first critic. Second critic, and these are you know identical in terms of their definitions, except for the name. Because again, when we save files, we want to save separate files for both critics. Otherwise, we're going to get a mess. Our value network and our target value. Okay, so now we have to compile our networks. We'll need our critic one. Running rate of beta. Value network. And our target value. Now, of course, the target value network doesn't perform any optimization. We just copy weights um, using our soft update rule, but it is part of a, it's just part of the framework that we have to compile the model before we can use it. Our scale factor and our initial update network parameters where we're going to do a hard copy of the parameters from the uh, online network to the target value network. The first function I want to handle is the choose action function. Uh, then we'll get to the remember function, the update network parameters, and our save model parameters. Finally, we'll get to the learn function. We'll save the best for last. So we want to convert our state, uh, our observation, to a tensor. And the neural network expects that we will have a batch dimension, so we have to do that. 
we have to add an, an extra dimension to get our batch. We want to get the actions. We don't really care about the log probs at this stage. And then we just go ahead and return actions zero because the tensor I believe is the output and we want to return a numpy array because the environment doesn't accept the tensorflow tensor as input to the step function. So this is a simple uh, interface function between the agent and its memory. And uh, this is necessary because you don't want to directly access the uh, values of the memory class from the agent class. It's just bad software design. You don't want to go overriding parameters of one class within another. You want to have an interface function that handles all of that for you that, where you use one function to call another. That's just clean software design. Always keep that in mind. That takes state, action, reward, new state. And it looks kind of silly. We could get away with it in this context because we're not going to be building on this code base later. Uh, but I always find it important to use strong and consistent software design principles wherever possible. Our update network parameters function is pretty straightforward. So we're going to pass in a tau, which is a default value of none. So if tau is none, then we want to go ahead and use our default value for tau. And this has to do with the fact that up here on line 153, we're calling update network parameters with the value of tau equals one to facilitate the hard network of hard network weight copy. So we're basically gonna uh, just go ahead and iterate over our network weights, do the calculation, append those to a list, and then uh, upload that list to our value target value network. Wait times tau plus targets times one minus tau. I have one too many parentheses there. That looks right. Set weights. And that is it for our update network parameters. Pretty straightforward. Next we have two bookkeeping functions to save our models. Those don't take any inputs. Svein, that is not useful information. So we just want to save the weights to the checkpoint file. Check pint, I'll take a pint, that sounds pretty good. And then the load models function is basically the inverse. So I'm just going to go ahead and yank and paste and then make sure to change save to load. So that way we don't do anything wonky. Actor.save weights, we want to change to load weights. Same deal we want to load from the checkpoint files. Okay, now we come to the hard part of the problem, the learn function. Now we've got a kitty cat joining us. Perhaps she will hop up on the desk. The first uh, consideration we have, so the first consideration we have is what we would do, what we do in the event that we haven't filled up enough of our memories to actually uh, load a batch size of those memories. And you can do many different things. You can uh, play batch size of transitions randomly and store those transitions and then call your learn function. Or in this case, you can just say, hey, if I haven't filled up at least batch size of memories, just go ahead and return. So that's what we're gonna do. And this is a 
Uh, this violates my principles of good software design where I'm calling the mem counter of the memory class directly here instead of using a function to get it. Uh, this is bad design. Um, <laughs> so don't do this if you have an option not to. I'm just doing this uh, because it's, like I said, it's not gonna matter. It's, this isn't a huge code base that we're be, gonna be building upon later, but it, just know that this isn't consistent with what I said earlier. I'm kind of backpedaling a little bit. Now we have to sample our memory. And we gotta pass in our batch size. Then we wanna go ahead and convert those to tensors. And I wanna be really consistent with my data types here. Uh, reason being, um, a lot of these frameworks, TensorFlow and PyTorch specifically, uh, get a little bit finicky when you start mixing up data types. They don't like to mix data types and calculations because that screws up the precision of the calculation. Uh, they want everything to be they want everything to be uh, consistent and explicit so that you get exactly what you expect because of course there is a rather significant difference in large calculations between floating point 32, floating point 64, even floating point 16 calculations. So it's very beneficial to go ahead and specify what data type you're using. In this case, we use float32. And we even, in theory, could get away with, uh, uh, sorry, these are <laughs> TF, not NP. We could get away with 16-point uh, 16 16 precision, 16-bit 16 precision, excuse me, because we don't need, you know, a whole bunch of decimal places in our rewards or anything like that. But we we'll use 32 just to be safe. So now we're gonna handle the update rule for our value network. So we need our gradient tape. So we're gonna pass the um, state states through our network and then squeeze to get rid of that batch dimensionality. Then we're going to do the same thing with our new states, except we're going to pass through the target value network. Squeeze again. What are the actions occurring according to our current policy and the log probs? So we're going to have to sample normal states and we of course don't do any reparameterization so then our log probs we have to squeeze then we get the values according to the new policy critic one states policy actions and then the value according to the second critic Then our critic value, not value, tf.squeeze, tf math minimum uh, between the q1 new policy, q2 new policy. And I'm missing a parenthesis there. There we go. Now we're going to squeeze it along the first dimension. So then our value target is going to be our critic value minus our log probs. That's from the paper. Value loss one half keras losses dot mean squared error between the value and the target value. Value target, sorry. Sorry, my toddler is rampaging again. So now we need to calculate our gradient. Good grief. I have the cat on my lap as well. That's making it very difficult to type. Uh, value loss, self.value.trainable variables. And we can stick that on a new line to be good little programmers. Then we have to apply our gradients 
optimizer.apply gradients zip value network gradient value trainable variables. And this is just how we do gradient descent using the gradient tape. And so that is it for our value network loss. Now we have our actor network and critic networks to worry about. So we need more gradient tapes. So we need our new policy actions and their log probs. We want to sample our uh, states. Oh, that's interesting. I have, I see. That's interesting. In my cheat sheet here, I have uh, the NumPy arrays, and it works. Interesting. I'll go ahead and fix that. So let's see if it breaks when I pass in the TensorFlow tensors. It shouldn't. I just uh, have a typo in my cheat sheet. So let's go ahead and squeeze our log probs and get some uh, new policy values. Dot uh, critic one, new policy actions, Q2, new policy. We have our critic value, squeeze, math minimum. Then our actor loss, just the log probs, minus that critic value, actor loss equals uh, math, reduce mean, actor loss, and then we have our actor network gradient, tape gradient, actor loss, the gradient of our loss with respect to our actor trainable variables. Then we want to apply our gradients, actor optimizer, and of course that expects a zip as input. And that handles our actor loss. And finally, we come to the critic loss. Now we have to pass the persistent equal true parameter to our function call because the loss is gonna have two components. So we'll have a critic one and critic two loss. If you don't pass the persistent equals true flag, it only keeps track of stuff for the application of a single set of gradients. So you can only do the update to one of your critic networks instead of both. So you tell it to just keep track of the gradients even after it go ahead, even after it applies gradients one time. So you can apply gradients twice. Our Q hat is our scale factor multiplied by our reward. That's where the entropy comes in. Gamma times value underscore one minus done. That is interesting. So this gives me a little bit of pause because uh, first of all, I know the code works. I've tested this and I haven't accidentally deleted a line, but what gives me pause here is that I have this value underscore, which is defined up in this other scope here. Uh, I'm actually missing a equal sign there. That would have triggered an error. Um, so it does work, that's interesting. I didn't know that the um, context manager shared the scoping of variables. I didn't know that. Uh, that is new information to me. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and roll with it for now. If this is suddenly broken and doesn't work, then I will come back and re-edit this and put in the new code that actually works, of course. Uh, but that is new information to me. See, I learn stuff even while making content. So we have to get the values according to the uh, old policy. Um, wow, 
Why do I call it old policy? Perhaps uh, go ahead and check the GitHub for this when I upload it. I will probably do some variable name swapping to make things a little bit more logical. Uh, if I have to scratch my head while I'm uh, typing out the code here, you're probably scratching your head watching it. Uh, of course, the losses are pretty straightforward, just mean squared error between the uh, Q1 and Q2 old policies and this Q hat value. Then we can go ahead and calculate our gradients. Critical network gradient. Then we want to go ahead and apply our gradients. Sorry, I set that critic to network gradient critic to trainable variables and then we want to call our update network parameters function after we've done all of our updates okay so that wraps up all of the heavy lifting for our code now we can move on to coding up the main loop which is going to be a cakewalk by comparison And of course, I have an invalid syntax error. Oh, that's easy. There's no self there. Uh, actions blank equals. And I've done it yet again. I am. Oh, because it's a. Sorry, my cat wants to steal the limelight there we go I did the same thing here of course why wouldn't I do the same thing there I like to be consistent okay so now we're gonna handle the main function so of course we'll need our pi bullet ENVs could be because we're gonna be dealing with the inverted pendulum bullet environment uh, we need our gym, we need numpy, we need um, our agent, we need our plot learning curve, and that is it. We're going to make our environment inverted. Pendulum bullet env v0. We need to make our agent pass in all of our <clears throat> relevant parameters. We'll play 250 games. Our figure file is just the directory plus the file name. You can condense that into one line if you want. It's not a problem. We say best score in the reward range zero. Score history, we want to keep track of the scores the agent receives over time so we can see if it's learning as well as to plot them later. And a load checkpoint variable which you can set the false if you want to load a checkpoint. So if we're going to load the checkpoint, 
going to load your models. And one thing I like to do is set the render mode to human so that way you can see the agent play the game because if you're loading a checkpoint, you probably want to uh, evaluate the performance. If not, just comment out this line. In other words, if you're doing checkpointing so that you can do more training later, then just get rid of that line, no big deal. So let's go ahead and play our games. Reset your environment at the top of every episode. Reset your done flag and set your score to zero. Play your episode by choosing an action. Take your action, get the new state, reward, done, and debug info back from the environment. Keep track of your score. Remember your transition. Not load checkpoint, then you want to learn. The logic here being that if you're loading a checkpoint, you're probably evaluating. If it's the case that you're just loading a checkpoint to perform more training later, then you're going to need to put that agent.learn um, outside of that if statement. Just get rid of the if statement, okay? So that you're you know going to do what you actually intend. Uh, no matter what, you need to set the current state to the new state. And at the end of the episode, you want to append the score to the score history. Calculate an average of the previous 100 games. If that average score is better than your best score, then set the best score to that average so that you know you're learning. And again, if not load checkpoint, agent.save models. And you want to print episode I score average score. And then when all the games are over, go ahead and plot your learning curve. Okay, moment of truth, let's see how many typos I made. Plot, <laughs> uh, that's easy, plog. Replay buffer has attribute new size. It should be mem size. Um, uh, self dot new size. I didn't do that elsewhere. I don't think. Okay. Let's. Did I not call it? call that is interesting so that is for my value network okay replay buffer critic and value network oh ah. there we go sorry about that indentation error as no attribute Sample. That's because it is sample normal. That is in line 223. Agent.sample normal. Uh, persistent. Because I forgot a T. That is in line 239. Versus tent equals true. That's another typo. Perfect. Eager ops is not callable. Uh, let's see. Self dot gamma times value underscore. Oh, I'm missing a multiplication sign. That is in line. Oop, 240. 
Sorry about that. Line 240. One mine is done. Good grief. Critic one underscore. That is in line 251. Oh, because it's not, there's no self in there. Okay. Good grief. There is no self there. Yep. Okay. Gradients do not exist for one of my layers. Okay. means I have forgotten something indeed. That's problematic because it doesn't tell me, well, these warnings here, don't worry about those. Those aren't a problem. This grading does not exist is in fact a problem. So let me see. I don't even know which network it is talking about there. Uh, it doesn't tell me. It says dense kernel zero. So that's probably whichever network I made first. So I instantiate my actor network first. So here is value actor loss. Hmm. Let's check out our handy dandy cheat sheet here. And so I have located the source of the issue and I will annotate this when I edit the video. But uh, the issue here is that I was passing the state through both the first fully connected and second fully connected layer instead of allowing the output of the first fully connected layer to feed into the second layer. So, of course, that's how deep neural networks work, and you won't get uh, anything useful if you don't um, feed things through properly. So let's go ahead and try it again. Okay, so now we get the same warning, and that's not concerning. Uh, it just has to do with uh, the precision. Um, so that's something you can um, deal with on your own if you want. I'm not going to go changing the back end settings. Uh, I could suppress the warning, but it doesn't really bother me that much. So I'm going to come back in a few minutes and make sure that this is learning. And when I do, I'll go ahead and show you the output of a fully trained network. And if it doesn't learn, then I'm going to go back and debug it. And you'll know because I'll tell you in a few minutes from your perspective. Okay, so here we are, and it's just a few minutes later. By game 60, we can see that the average score is improving with each episode, meaning that it is in fact learning, and it's getting well over 100. And so I'm gonna switch to the other terminal where I have finished running it. I'm not gonna wait for it to play all 250 games because it does take quite a while once it gets closer to 1,000 steps. So hold on one moment. So here is the output of an earlier model I trained. And uh, I'm just checking the other window to make sure it is indeed still learning, and it is. It's saving models pretty much with every game. So this is an output of a model I ran earlier, uh, where you can see that for the last several games, it gets a consistent score of 1,000, with a little bit of a low flyer here at 751, still a respectable score. It doesn't have 100 games of 1,000, so the average score hasn't hit 1,000, but it is trending well up. On its way so I consider that to be a fully trained model if it ran another 50 games 100 games then the average score would be 100 and we would have beaten the environment so that is solved actor critic in tensorflow 2 uh, I left out the reparameterization because I don't think it's entirely necessary uh, I don't know why it was put in the original paper uh, I have implemented it in PyTorch. You can see that video if you want to see how that works. It's just uh, passing in a parameter to your sample function. And if that parameter is true, then you use the R sample instead of the sample function from your distribution. If you want to implement that in TensorFlow 2, I'll leave that as an exercise to the viewer, but you would have to do some simple calculation of adding in some spherically sampled noise to it. So that's not, you know, it's not particularly difficult. It's just something I didn't want to bother with. Uh, so this agent learn, that is soft after critic in TensorFlow 2, uh, an incredibly powerful algorithm, uh, indeed state of the art. I prefer TD3. I think it tends to perform a little bit better, but this is certainly no slouch in and of itself. I hope that was helpful. Leave a comment, a question, 
a subscribe, certainly if you've made it this far, and I will see you in the next video. If you give me about 45 minutes of your time, I will show you how to code a fully functional asynchronous advantage actor critic agent in the PyTorch framework starting from scratch. We're going to have about 10 to 15 minutes of lecture followed by an about 30 minute interactive coding tutorial. Let's get started. Really quick, if you're the type of person that likes to read content, I have an associated blog post where I'm going to go into much more detail. Check the link in the description. Deep reinforcement learning really exploded in 2015 with the development of the deep Q-learning algorithm. One of the main innovations in this algorithm that helped it to uh, achieve such popularity is the use of a replay buffer. The replay buffer solves a very fundamental problem in deep reinforcement learning. And that problem is that neural networks tend to produce garbage output when their inputs are correlated. What could be more correlated than an agent playing a game where each time step depends on the one taken immediately before it? These correlations cause the agent to exhibit very strange behaviors where it will know how to play the game and suddenly forget when it encounters some new set of states that it's never seen before. The neural network really isn't able to generalize from previously seen states to unseen states due to the complexity of the parameter space of the underlying problems. The replay buffer fixes this problem by allowing the agent to randomly sample agents from many, many different episodes. This guarantees that those time steps taken are totally uncorrelated, and so the agent gets a broad sampling of parameter space and is therefore able to learn a more robust policy with respect to new inputs. As I've shown before on this channel, problems arise when you attempt to simply bolt on a replay buffer onto the actor critic algorithm. It doesn't really seem to work, and in fact, it's not very robust. Actor critic methods in particular uh, suffer from being especially brittle, and so adding on a replay buffer really doesn't help to address that problem. In 2016, a group of researchers managed to solve this problem using something called asynchronous deep reinforcement learning. It's a totally different paradigm for approaching the deep reinforcement learning problem, and in fact, the technology can be applied to a wide variety of algorithms. In the original paper, they detail solutions for deep Q learning, N step SARSA, excuse me, N step uh, Q learning as well as SARSA, and actor critic methods as well. So what is this big innovation? Well, instead of having a replay buffer, we're going to allow a large number of agents to play independently on totally separate and self-contained environments. Each of these environments will live on a CPU thread in contrast to a GPU for most deep key learning applications. This has the additional benefit that uh, if we don't use a replay buffer, we don't have to store a million transitions, which for trivial environments really doesn't matter, but if you're dealing with something like, say, the Atari library, a million transitions can take up a significant amount of RAM, which can be a limiting factor for enthusiasts. So having the agent play a bunch of different games in parallel on separate environments, only keeping track of a small number of transitions, vastly reduces the memory footprint required for deep reinforcement learning. So in what sense exactly is this algorithm asynchronous? What this means exactly in this context is that we're going to have a large number of parallel CPU threads with agents playing in their own environments. They're going to be acting at the same time, but at various times they're going to be deciding what to do as well as updating their deep neural network parameters. And so we're not going to have any one agent sitting around waiting on another agent to finish playing the game to update its own set of deep neural network parameters. Each one will be totally independent and learning on its own. Now we're not going to be simply throwing away the learning from each agent after it finishes the episode. Rather, we're going to be updating the network parameters of some global optimizer as well as some global actor critic agent. So we have one actor critic agent that sits atop all of the others and the local agents that do all the learning by interacting with their environments. So what is the advantage part of A3C? So the advantage essentially means what is the relative advantage of one state over another? It stands to reason that an agent can maximize his total score over time by seeking out those states which are most advantageous or have the highest expected future return. The paper gives a relatively straightforward calculation for this. All we have to do is take the discounted sum of the rewards received over some fixed length trajectory and then add on an appropriately discounted value estimate for the final state the agent saw in that trajectory. Please note that this could be some fixed number like say five steps, or it could be three steps if the agent encountered a terminal, uh, terminal state along the way. 
We're then going to go ahead and subtract off the agent's estimate of the value of whatever current time step it's in in the trajectory. So that way we're always taking the value of the next state minus the current state. That's what gives us the relative advantage. So what does the actor critic portion of A3C mean? Specifically, this refers to a class of algorithms that use two separate neural networks to do two separate things. So the actor network is responsible for telling the agent how to act, kind of a clever name, right? It does this by approximating a mathematical function known as the policy. The policy is just the probability of selecting any of the available actions for the agent given it's in some state. And so for a discrete action space, it's going to be a relative probability of selecting one action over another. So in our cart pull, it's going to be, say, 60% move left, 40% move right, so on and so forth. We're going to facilitate this by having two separate networks. The actor network will take a state or set of states as input and output a softmax probability distribution that we're going to be feeding into a categorical distribution from the PyTorch framework. We can then sample that categorical distribution to get the actual action for our agent. And we can also use that to calculate the log of the probability of selecting that action according to the distribution, probability distribution. And we will use that for the update rule for our actor. Now the critic has a little bit of a different role. The critic essentially criticizes what the agent, the actor did. It said, you know, that action you took gave us a pretty lousy state that doesn't have a very large expected future return. And so we shouldn't really try to take that action given that state any other time that we encounter it. So the critic essentially criticizes what the actor does and the two kind of play off of each other to access more and more adv advantageous states over time. Before we go ahead and talk about the specifics of each class, let's get some idea of the general structure and flow of the program. The basic idea is that we're going to have some global optimizer and global actor critic agent that sits on top that keeps track of everything the, the local agents learn in their own individual threads. Each agent will get its own specific thread where it can interact with its own totally distinct and separate environment. The agent will play either some fixed number of time steps or until it encounters a terminal state, at which point it will perform the loss calculation to do the gradient descent on the global optimizer. Once it calculates those gradients, it's going to upload it to the global optimizer and then re-download the parameters from that global optimizer. Now keep in mind, each agent is going to be doing this asynchronously. So while one agent is performing its loss calculations, another agent may have already finished that loss calculation and updated the global optimizer. That's why right after calculating the gradients, we want to go ahead and download the global parameters from the global actor critic. So that way we make sure we are always operating with the most up-to-date parameters. After each time the agent uh, performs an update to its deep neural network, we're going to want to go ahead and zero out its memory so that it can start fresh for another sequence of five or until it encounters a terminal state number of steps. So now let's talk implementation details. We're going to have a few separate distinct classes for this. The first of which is going to be overriding the Atom optimizer from the base PyTorch package. So we're going to have a shared Atom class that derives from the base Torch Optim Atom class. And this will have the simple functionality of telling PyTorch that we want to share the parameters of a global optimizer among a, a pool of threads. It's only going to be a few lines long and it's much easier than it sounds and I'll show you how to do it in code. Our next class will be the actor critic network. Now, typically we would use shared input layers between an actor and a critic where we simply have one input layer and two outputs corresponding to the probability distribution pi and the value network v. But in this case, we're gonna host two totally separate distinct networks within one class. It's a relatively simple problem, the card pull, and so we're gonna be able to get away with this. The reason I'm doing it this way is because I frankly could not get shared input layers to work with the PyTorch multiprocessing uh, framework. Our agent will also have a memory, which we're just gonna use simple lists for that. We're gonna append states, actions, and rewards uh, to those lists, and then go ahead and set those lists back to empty lists when we need to clear the agent's memory. We're going to have a function for calculating the returns where we're going to use the calculation according to the algorithm presented within the paper. So the idea is that we're going to start at the terminal step or the final step in the trajectory. If that step is terminal, the R or the return gets set to zero. If it's not, it gets set to the current estimate of the value of that particular state. Then we're going to work backward from the T minus one time step all the way to the beginning. And we're going to update R as 
r sub i plus gamma times the previous value of r. Now I'm going to do a calculation in the video, the coding portion, to show you that these two are equivalent, meaning this calculation as well as the earlier advantage uh, description I gave you. I'm going to make sure that you understand that those are actually equivalent, and it's just a few lines of mathematics, so it's not really that difficult, and I've taken the liberty of doing it for you. Then we're going to be calculating the loss functions, and these will uh, be done according to the loss functions given in the paper. So for our critic, we're going to be taking the delta between those returns and the values and taking the mean squared error. For our actor, we're going to be taking the log prob of the policy and multiplying it by the advantage and with a negative one factor thrown in there as well. Now that's a really cool way of calculating the loss for the actor because it has a pretty neat property. So when we multiply the advantage by the log of the probability, what we're actually doing is weighting uh, at probabilities according to the advantage they produce. So uh, actions that produce a high advantage are going to get naturally weighted higher and higher over time. And so we're going to naturally evolve our policy towards being better over time, which is precisely what we want, right? Our final class will be the agent class, and this will derive from the multiprocessing process subclass. So here's where all of the real main type functionality is going to happen. So we're going to be passing in our global optimizer as well as our global actor critic agent, instantiating 16 in the case of 16 threads for a CPU, uh, local critics with 16 separate environments, and then each one of those is going to have you know two separate loops where it's going to go up until the number of episodes that we dictate and it's going to play each episode. As I described earlier, uh, within each episode it's going to play some fixed sequence number of steps and then it is going to perform some update to the global optimizer and then download the parameters from the global actor critic agent. Our main loop is basically going to set everything up. We're going to go ahead and define all of our parameters, create our global uh, actor critic, our global optimizer, and tell PyTorch that we want to share the memory for our global actor critic agent. And then we're going to make a list of workers or agents. And then we're going to go ahead and send each of those a start command as well as a join command so that we can get everything rocking and rolling. So what are some critiques of this algorithm overall? Well, one is that it is exceptionally brittle. Uh, most actor critic methods require a fair amount of hyperparameter tuning, and this one is no exception. I tried to use the lunar lander environment, but couldn't really get a good set of parameters to make it run effectively and get a you know a consistent score of 200 or above, or heck, even a consistent score of over 100. I would have called that good enough for YouTube. Another one is that there is a significant amount of run-to-run -run variation, so it's highly sensitive to initial parameters. You can solve this by uh, setting global seeds for the random number generators so that you're getting uh, consistent uh, random numbers over time, and so you're going to know exactly how you're starting. Uh, but to me, that's a little bit kind of like cheating, so I don't do it in this video, but it is something to take note of. And in the original paper, I think they do something like 50 different runs of each evaluation, some large number to get a pretty tight or to get a pretty solid distribution of scores. And that is, I think, because of the high degree of run to run variation. Okay, I have lectured at you enough. Again, if you like to read written content, I have a link in the description to a blog post where I talk about this in a little bit more detail. Uh, but nonetheless, let's go ahead and jump right into the coding tutorial. Let's go ahead and start with our imports. We will need Jim for our environment. We'll need our base torch package. We'll need torch multiprocessing to handle all of the multiprocessing type stuff. We will need torch NN to handle our layers. We'll need NN functional to handle our activation functions. And we're going to need our distribution as well. And in this case, we're going to need a categorical distribution. All this does is takes a probability output from a deep neural network, maps it to a distribution so that you can do some actual sampling to get the real actions for your agent. Now, I want to start with the shared atom class. This will handle the fact that we are going to be sharing a single optimizer among all of our different agents that interact with separate environments. All we're going to do here is call the base atom initializer and then iterate over the uh, parameters in our parameter groups, setting the steps exponential average and exponential average squared to uh, zeros effectively, and then telling it to share those parameters amongst the different pools in our multi-threading pool. 
and this will derive from the base atom class. Our default values are going to be, I believe, identical to the defaults for uh, the atom class. And then we want to call our super constructor. Now we're going to handle setting our initial values. And then we're going to tell uh, Torch that we want to share the memory for our parameters, or for our uh, gradient descent. And note the presence of the underscore at the end of memory there. Okay, that is it for the shared atom. Pretty straightforward. Next up, we want to handle the actor critic network, which will also encapsulate a lot of the functionality I would typically put into an agent class because of my understanding of the design principles of object-oriented software programming. Uh, in this case, I have to shimmy a few things around because the agent class is going to handle the um, multi-processing elements of our problem, and so it doesn't really make sense to stick this, uh, like the choose action or memory, uh, memory functionality in the agent class, so we're going to stick it in the network class. It's not a huge deal, it's just a departure from how I normally do things, and certainly not everybody does things the same way I do. So our initializer takes input dims from our environment, number of actions from our agent and a default value for gamma of 0 0.99. Uh, we also have to save our gamma and the next thing we want to handle is writing our actual deep neural network. Now this is also a little bit different than the way I normally do things. Normally, I would have a shared input layer that branches out into a policy and a value network as two separate outputs with that shared input layer. When I tried to do that, I found that the software doesn't actually run. It doesn't handle the threading aspect very well in that case when you have shared input layers uh, from a deep neural network. I don't know exactly why that is. If you know, please leave a comment down below because I'd be very curious to hear the explanation. It's simply what I found out through my own experimentation. So we're going to have two separate inputs, one for the policy and one for the value network, as well as two separate outputs. So they're effectively two distinct networks within one single class. And we're only going to be using 128 neurons here, not a very large network. And our output will take those 128 hidden neurons and convert it into number of actions. And our value function will take likewise the 128 hidden layers, hidden elements, and convert it to a single value. Or if you pass in a batch of states, a batch of values. The agent also, excuse me, the network also has uh, some basic memory. So rewards, actions, and states. These we will handle just by appending stuff to a list and then and each time we call the learning function we're going to want to reset that memory. So let's go ahead and handle that functionality first. So the remember just appends a state action reward to the relevant list.
and the clear memory function just zeroes out all those lists. Pretty straightforward. Next we have our feed forward function. That takes a state as input. So we're going to pass that state through our first uh, input layer for our policy and perform a ReLU activation on that and do something similar for the value input layer. And the outputs of those two are going to be passed to the, rel to the relevant policy and value outputs. And then we just return pi and v. Pretty straightforward yet again. Next, we're going to have our function to calculate the returns from our sequence of steps. So this will only take a single input, and that will be the terminal flag. Uh, recall that the return for the terminal step is identically zero, so we need the terminal flag or the done flag to accommodate that. So we want to go ahead and um, convert the states from our memory to a torch tensor of t dot float data type because it is a little particular about the data type. You don't want to pass it in double. It gives you an error. So best to take care of it now. We're going to go ahead and pass that through our neural network. And we're not going to be concerned with the policy output at this stage. We just want to know what the value evaluations the critic has for that set of states. So our return is going to be is going to start out as the last element of that list, so the terminal step or the last step in the sequence of steps, and we're going to multiply that by one minus int done, so that if the episode is over, one minus done is zero. So you're multiplying by zero, you get zero. Uh, pretty handy way of handling that. Then we're going to handle the calculation of the returns at all the other time steps. So we're going to go ahead and uh, iterate over the reversed memory and say that our return is the reward at that time step plus gamma times r. And then just return, excuse me, append that return to the list of batch returns. And then finally at the end, you want to go ahead and reverse that list again so that it's in the same order in which you encounter the states. This calculation reverses it because you're starting at the end when you know the value of the final state or at least the estimate of the value according to the critic and then uh, reversing it uh, to get it back in order for passing it into our loss calculation function. Now this may be a strange form to you. Um, if you write it out by hand, maybe I can show you something here where I did it for you. If you write it out by hand, this particular chunk of code, you can see that it's identical to what they tell you the calculation is in the paper. So yeah, you can do that exercise on your own to convince yourself, or I can just show it to you so that uh, I can convince you of it. But this is indeed the return calculation from the paper. Everything is as it should be. And then I want to convert that to a tensor. And return it. Next, we have to handle the calculation of our loss function. And this, again, is um, only a single input, the terminal flag from the environment. We're going to go ahead and get the value, excuse me, the tensor representations of our states and actions right at the beginning. And then we're going to go ahead and calculate our returns. And then we're going to perform the updates. So we're going to be passing the states through our actor critic network to get the new values as well as then a distribution according to the current values of our deep neural network. We're going to use that distribution to get the log probs of the actions the agent actually took at the time it took them. Uh, and then we're going to uh, use those quantities for our loss functions. Values that squeeze. Now this squeeze is very important. 
Uh, if you don't squeeze here, it won't trigger an error, but it will give you the wrong answer. The reason it will do that is because the uh, actor loss and the uh, critic loss, I believe, will come out as shape 5 by 5 and that is not the shape we want. We want something in the case of uh, five time steps, T max equals five. So it'll give you a five by five matrix instead of a five element vector. So you have to perform the squeeze here to get the five by one output of the deep neural network into something that is just five, a list of five elements or a vector of five elements instead of five by one. So definitely need that squeeze. If you don't believe me, by all means, erase the line or comment it out and print out the shapes of things to the terminal. I always recommend doing that. Uh, it's a good way of, of solidifying your understanding of how all this stuff works. So then our critic loss is just the returns minus values squared. Pretty straightforward. So now let's go ahead and say that we want the softmax activation of our output and uh, that has a property that, of course, the softmax guarantees that uh, every action has a finite value and that uh, the value, the probabilities add up to one, as all probability distributions distributions should. So then we use that output to create a categorical distribution and uh, calculate the log probability distribution of our actions actually taken. Then our actor loss minus log probs times uh, the quantity returns minus values. That's from the paper. And then our total loss is just critic loss plus actor loss dot mean. And we have to sum the two together because of the way that the back propagation is handled by PyTorch. And of course, I did forget the choose action function, uh, but that is not a big deal. We'll just go ahead and handle that now. So that will take, we're gonna call it observation as input, because we're gonna be passing in the raw observation from our environment. And so we have to convert that to a tensor right off the bat, and we have to add a uh, batch dimension to that for compatibility with the inputs of our deep neural network. And we're going to call it a D type of float. We pass that through our neural network, get our policy and value function out, perform a soft max activation on our policy along the first dimension. Then we're going to create our distribution based on those probabilities and sample it and convert it to a NumPy quantity, take the zeroth element and return it. So that is it for our actor network class. It encapsulates most of the functionality I would associate with the agent, but it does everything we're gonna need each of the independent actors within their own thread to do. Now we're gonna move on to the agent class that is gonna handle our multiprocessing functionality. So I'm gonna call this agent. You will sometimes see it referred to as worker, and that is a fine name. That is kind of precisely what it is. I'm just using agent to be consistent with my previous nomenclature. It has to derive from the mp.process class, uh, so we get some access to some goodies there. So we will need our global actor critic. That is what is going to handle the uh, functionality of keeping track of all the learning from all of our environment specific agents. The optimizer, that is going to be the shared atom optimizer that we wrote earlier. Input dims, number of actions, uh, gamma in case you want to use something other than 0 0.99. A learning rate, a name to keep track of each of the workers from our uh, multiprocessing. The global episode index, so this will keep track of the total number of episodes run by all of our agents. Uh, it's not as easy as a, of a concept as it may seem because you're doing uh, asynchronous processing, as well as an environment ID. So the first thing I'm gonna do is call our super constructor and go ahead and start saving stuff. 
So our local actor critic is just going to be our uh, a new actor critic with inputs of input dims, number of actions, and gamma. We want to save our global actor critic so that we can update its parameters. We're going to have a name for each worker in its own independent thread, and that's just going to be um, just worker number uh, name. And then we'll have uh, an episode index. Global episode IDX. Our environment. So environment ID is a string here. That isn't clear. Um, and our optimizer. Did I spell that correctly? Yes, I believe I did. So we have to define a very specific function so that stuff actually works. And that function is the run function. This gets called behind the scenes by the uh, worker.start function that we're going to handle in the main loop. But this handles effectively uh, all the main loop type functionality of our problem. So our global time step is going to get set to 1, while our episode IDX dot value. So episode IDX is a global parameter from uh, the multiprocessing class, and that uh, we want to get the value by using the dot value dereference. And while that's less the number of games, some some global variable we're going to define. Uh, in other words, while we have not completed all of our games, uh, set your terminal flag to false, reset your environment, and set the score to zero, and go ahead and clear the agent's uh, memory at the top of every episode. And then while you're not done, so go ahead and play your sequence of episodes. You see, I'm sorry, sequence of steps within an episode. The action is chosen by your local actor critic. So you're going to pass the observation into each local actor critic. So each uh, of the 16 in this case threads will get its own local actor critic and that'll synchronize to the global. But you never actually use the global network directly to do things like choosing actions. So get the new state reward done and debug info back from your environment. Keep track of the reward received as part of the total score. Remember that observation, action, and reward. Then we have to say if the number of steps modulus the maximum number of steps is zero. In other words, uh, if it is every if it is every fifth time step, or we have finished the episode with that last time step, then we're going to go ahead and perform our learning step. Modulus t max, or we're done. Then we're going to go ahead and handle the learning functionality. So we'll say loss equals local actor critic.calc loss. And of course, we need the most recent terminal flag as the parameter for that function, the argument. Go ahead and zero your gradient and back propagate your loss. So we're going to set the parameter for the uh, global gradient to the local agent's gradient at this step. And then uh, after doing that, we can tell our optimizer to step. And then we can go ahead and synchronize our uh, networks.
and we do that by loading the state dictionary from our global actor critic to our local one. And then we want to go ahead and clear the memory after each learning step and then tell the algorithm to increment t step by one, the global time step, and set the current state to the new state. Then at the end of every episode, we have to handle the uh, the fact that we may have finished an episode from another agent while one thread was running, uh, because this is running asynchronous, asynchronously. So we say with self.global, uh, sorry, self.episode.idx dot get lock. So we want to make sure that no other thread is trying to access that variable right now. And if we can, go ahead and increment that episode value by one. Then we do the usual print the debug stuff to the terminal. We're going to print out the name of the worker, uh, the episode. And that is self episode IDX value and the reward. Uh, the total score from the episode. And that is it for our agent class. So this is relatively straightforward. All we're doing is uh, handling the fact that we have our local parameter, our local agent that chooses actions. We're going to perform the gradient descent optimizer uh, update using the um, gradients calculated by the actions of that agent, and then upload that to our global network uh, so that every every agent uploads its learnings to the global network, and then we're going to go ahead and download that from our global network as well so that we uh, make each agent in its own thread better over time. Now we have our main loop and uh, we're going to do some stuff like declaring our learning rate, our environment ID, cart poll v0. Number of actions for that environment is just two left and right. Input dims is just a four vector. Uh, we'll say number of games, 5,000. You know, we can actually get away with 3,000, I believe. Uh, T max every five steps. That comes from the paper. Our global actor critic gets initialized here. And that takes input dims and number of actions. We want to tell that global actor critic uh, object that we want to share its memory. Then we have our optimizer. What are we going to be optimizing and sharing? The parameters of our global actor critic network. Learning rate defined by learning rate and betas 0 0.92, 0999. I get that from more Van Joe's stuff. Uh, I haven't experimented with that too much. A little bit of carbo cargo cult programming here. I apologize for that. Now we have our global episode, and that is just going to be a value of type i. That means unsigned integer, doesn't mean i as in a counter variable. You could also have uh, d for a double if you wanted to keep track of like a score or something like that. Uh, i just means unsigned integer, or no, it's a, it's a signed integer. So it can be negative as well as positive. Now we have to create a list of workers, and that's gonna be a list of our agents. And this is what's this is the construct that we're going to use to handle the um, starting and running of our specific threads. So that's an agent. We have to pass in our global actor critic, our optimizer, our input dims, number of actions, a gamma, a learning rate. It's helpful to use commas. Our name is just going to be the um, the name is just going to be the uh, I in our list comprehension. Our global episode IDX is going to be that global EP variable we just uh, defined. And we're going to pass in our environment ID for I in range multiprocessing.cpu count. Now, I haven't noticed a huge difference in uh, running this with different numbers, so something other than CPU count in the range. 
I have 16 threads. If I tell it eight, it still uses all 16. So I'm probably missing something here. Uh, I could do a deeper dive into the documentation to figure it out. Uh, but for the purposes of the video, I'm just going to go ahead and roll with it. So now we want to go ahead and start all of our workers. And then go ahead and do our join operation. Okay, so now moment of truth. I want to find out how many typos I made in the recording of this. Let's go ahead and do a right quit. I already have an invalid syntax. So I say for reward in. That's an easy one. Ah, no others. So let's say a3c.py. Okay, name env is not defined. That's because it is self.env. So that is in line 114. Self.env reset. Cannot assign torch float tensor as child module pi1. Torch and then module or none expected. So that is when I handle the feed forward in our choose action function. Ooh, this is an interesting one. I haven't encountered this before. Let's take a look. Cannot assign as child module pi1. Oh, uh, that's because, interesting. Oh, of course, yeah. <laughs> Obviously, I don't want that self here. I'll have to annotate that when I am editing the video. Uh, that is obviously going to be problematic. So you'll probably have seen that already that I put in a no self dot in there. Okay, that's the beauty of doing things for, uh, oh, it's because it's log prob, not log probs. That's in 85. Prob. I hope I remember all these. This none type object has no attribute backward. I probably forgot to return my loss. Yeah, that's right. And there we go. All right, now it's running. Hopefully, it's still going to record even though it is running across all of our threads. Looks like we're still good. Now you see that executed really, really fast. Um, it was so fast, I didn't even have time to get up the thread count, the uh, resource monitor to show you guys. Uh, but you can see here that it achieves a non-negligible score. So that indicates some learning is going on. Now let's go ahead and run it again. And you can see now this time, it's not doing any learning at all. So there is a significant amount of run to run variation. So I'll let it run and finish. And we'll try one more time. And maybe we'll get lucky and it will actually approach a score of 200. Nope. That's one of my big criticisms of this algorithm is that there is a significant amount of run to run variation. And it is pretty brittle with respect to some other algorithms that came later. Basically the main advantage here is that it's asynchronous and this paradigm can be employed on many different types of algorithms as you read in the paper. You know, it can be applied to deep key learning as well as uh, n-step learn, uh, SARSA, stuff like that. Okay, so it's getting a little closer. Okay, so this one took a little bit longer because the episodes actually achieved scores of 200, which is the max. Uh, not every thread manages to be a winner. Not all of us can be winners in life. That's a nice little microcosm of the universe. Uh, but you can see that for the most part, uh, some of the workers, actually I wonder if there's consistency amongst, so worker 11 got uh, 200, 
And if I scan down here, another worker 11, 142, 161. Interesting. So uh, you do get uh, actual learning across your agents. Uh, it's just not super consistent. And that is my biggest criticism of this algorithm is that it has a high degree of run to run variation, as you can see. Uh, but it's still pretty good. It's an interesting take on deep reinforcement learning. And uh, I, I do enjoy the algorithm. It's just not what I would categorize as the top two or three algorithm in actor critic methods. I hope this was illustrative for you. I hope you found it very helpful. If you have made it this far, please consider subscribing. Leave a like, a comment down below, and I'll see you in the next video.